Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I call to order the Ventura County Planning Commission. Please rise and face the flag for the salute. Place your hand over your heart and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If you have a cell phone, please either turn it off or put it on silent at this time. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? Commissioner McGee? Here. Commissioner Dukas? Here. Commissioner Lonstadt? Here. Commissioner Wessner? Present. Commissioner Rodriguez? Here. Item number four on our agenda is the time for public comments. These are an opportunity for the public to speak on any matter not agendized. Uh, but be, please be aware that under the government code section no company known as the Brown Act, the Commission can only receive the information and we cannot act upon it, however we could agendize it for the future, so that other public members would be aware of what we would discuss. Are there, is there anyone who would like to speak on any item not currently on the agenda? Okay, moving on. Approval of the minutes of August 25th. Move adoption. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Aye. Are we supposed to hit the magic button? Hmm? Okay. Uh, you made the motion. And Paul. Okay. There we go. Excellent. All right. Moving on to item number six, LU09-0036, Danny Everett and Tarza Taylor's uh, CUP request. And our uh, case planner is Michelle today. And before Michelle speaks, just for the public, um, this is the way the Board of Supervisors has uh, ordered our agenda that uh, we will listen to the staff report first. The commission then will ask questions of the staff for clarification or further information. At that point in time, the applicant will be permitted to speak to present the, their case. At that point in time, uh, I will open the public hearing. All those in favor of the recommended action will speak first. All those opposed to the recommended action will speak next, and then the applicant gets the final uh, rebuttal and then we will hear closing comments from staff and at that time I will close the public hearing and we will hold the deliberation. Okay, uh, I understand there's maybe a little confusion on the recommended action. The recommended action is to deny the CUP. So I want everybody to be clear on that situation. All right, Michelle, thank you. Thank you, Chair Wessner. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. My name is Michelle Glukert Deanna. I'm here to present case LU090036. It's a request for a conditional use permit for temporary outdoor events. Before I begin my presentation on these cases, I just wanted to confirm that you received Exhibit 12, which is an errata memo that clarifies that the correct project description is included in Exhibit 4. Additionally, we've received um, additional exhibits this morning, uh, D, E, F, and G. Just wanted to make sure your commission has received all of those. The project site is located in Upper Ojai, about one mile north of Highway 150. The site address is 12695 Koenigstein Road. The parcel is 9.25 acres and the proposed CUP boundary is 4.5 acres. The applicant is requesting a CUP for temporary outdoor events. Specifically, the request is for 30 events per year, Monday through Sunday. The applicant proposes only one event per weekend and no more than two events per month with a maximum of 125 guests. The event setup is proposed to begin as early as 10 a.m. with events ending no later than 10.30 p.m. and all guests and vendors vacating the property by 11 p.m. 
The proposal includes a bridal changing room, portable toilets for guests. For parking, it would include 50% on-site parking and 50% of guests would utilize a shuttle service. The applicant has also proposed a temporary event, temporary event lighting per a lighting plan, which was included in your staff report as Exhibit 6, along with a public safety plan, which is included in the staff report Exhibit 5. This is the site plan that's included in your staff report as Exhibit 3. On this site plan on the PowerPoint, we chose to call out some of the main areas on the property just for reference. Area 1, which is designated in red, is the proposed parking area. Area 2, which is shown in blue, is the main residence, and this is not proposed to be used for events. Area 3, which is shown in green, is the proposed bridal changing room. 4, shown in purple, are the proposed event areas. And 5, shown in yellow, indicates where Koenigstein Road is in relation to the property. This graphic was prepared by the Ventura County Public Works Agency and it shows the parcel in red at the end of Koningstein Road, which is just over a mile from Highway 150. As shown in this exhibit, the first half of the road closest to Highway 150 was improved in 1981 to meet county standards. And there's a photo in the lower right-hand side of the page which shows what the road looks like in that area. The second half of the road does not meet county standards, and the photo at the top middle of the page shows the portion of the road that's directly outside of the subject parcel. The next few slides show a series of photos that were submitted by the applicant in March of 2013, showing the proposed secondary access road. As you can see from the photos, the road varies in condition width and surface and there are some instances along the proposed secondary access road where there are locked gates which would need to be opened in order to provide access. The Ventura County Fire Protection District determined that the applicant cannot demonstrate adequate secondary access to meet the requirements of the Ventura County Fire Protection District. Therefore, there are five general plan findings that cannot be made for this project, and there's a detailed discussion of those in Section C of the staff report. Additionally, planning staff has determined that two of the required CUP findings cannot be made for this project, and a discussion of those can be found in Section E1 and E4 of the staff report. Today's hearing was properly noticed. A legal notice was published in the Ventura County Star. A mailed notice was sent to property owners within 300 feet of the project site. An email notification was sent to everyone on the interested parties list. And the agenda and staff report was posted on the Planning Division website. The Planning Division recommends that your commission take the actions that are listed in Section G of the staff report, which include to certify your review and consideration of this item find that the project is exempt from CEQA, deny the CUP, and specify that the clerk of the Planning Commission be the custodian of the record. At this time, this concludes my presentation. I also wanted to inform your commission that Masood Aragi, Fire Marshal for the Ventura County Fire Protection District, is here with me today to address any questions that your commission may have about the fire district's review of the project, as well as the determination that the secondary access road is not adequate. And of course, the planning division is also available for your questions. Thank you. Any questions of the staff at this time? Commissioner Vadukas? Have you had a, a chance to uh, look over and prepare responses to the, um, the letter we got this morning for, from the attorney, uh, Daniel Friedlander? No, we have not. Okay, C could you by the end of the hearing? Staff be able to res respond at that time? Commissioner Chair, uh, uh, Commissioner Idukis, yeah, actually, we have received the letter. We've read it. However, we haven't prepared any sort of written responses to it. But Mr. Aragi from the Fire 
Protection District, he's here. He could respond to the specific questions regarding the interpretation of the fire code. Well, so. th that's central to the letter that uh, that there has been a misapplication of the fire codes to this uh, project. Have you had a chance to look it over, and, and could you um, um, address? No? no? Before that, the letter references an appeal a process for the fire department. Is that as it? The letter references an appeal process for the, for the determination of the fire department. Has, is there such a process, and has that, is, it, are, is that process still available to the applicant? Uh, good morning. Uh, yes, I, I did. Uh, the question actually came up a while ago, whether they could go to the fire appeals board uh, and uh, appeal the project before coming here. And uh, I contacted the county council, and the county council determined, our county council determined that that wasn't the case. Was or uh, wasn't, It sir? was not the case. Uh, they couldn't do that because of two reasons. One was that uh, the application is before the planning, not the fire. So the, the, we are really recommending or uh, providing condition to a project, to a CUP. Uh, if it was directly to the fire, if the application was directly to the fire, then that avenue would have been available. The other reason is that the applicant is uh, requesting a waiver of a requirement where uh, fire board cannot waive any of the fire requirements. So if the uh, county council determined that that wasn't the case, they determined that the body that needs to review the appeal is planning commission. So that's uh, what the advice I got from the county council. It, it, but the it, actual letter I just got this morning. Uh, okay, me too. Yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, but it also states that this is a misapplication of the of the standard because there's no new construction, there's no subdivision, there's uh, uh, and and the argument is that uh, that if you do a close reading of the regulations. They're uh, not intended to, to cover something like this. How do you respond? Actually, that is not quite accurate because when you look at the fire code, there's a section in the fire code that talks about additional access, and it, requi and it allows or authorizes the fire code official uh, to require more than one fire apparatus access road based on the potential for impairment of a single road by vehicle congestion, condition of train, climatic conditions, or other factors that could limit access. And uh, what they're looking at is the ordinance, which is part of the fire code. The fire code itself gives the authorization to the fire official to require secondary access at any time any one of those conditions uh, comes into play, which yeah. in this case it does. And is, so it allows broad discretion? That's correct. Okay, understood. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions to staff at this time? Or did it, you is there a period of time after a decision is rendered for which a party must appeal or waive the, the appeal? Not that I know of. I'm not quite sure yet. Go ahead. Sure. What is... Um, <clears throat> they would like 125 guests. Uh, uh, what is the maximum number of guests that something like this, say if there was you know, something further down the road, what is the maximum number of guests that you could host without this secondary access? Uh, when we look at the project, we really looked at uh, three different options to begin with. And one of the first options we looked at was uh, shelter in place. We were looking at it and say, well, can we... If we can't use that road, can we have a safe place for guests to stay? The 125, I don't think that includes the cater. Uh, so you're looking at roughly around 150 people, probably. And we were looking at it as to they have open area. So we did run some fire models. And we determined that the really to use the open area for staging people there wasn't going to work because we're based on the topography and the vegetation the area that we needed was far greater than what that area they had. And plus, on top of that, the human psychology of it, that people were outside their uh, encounter with embers, uh, shower, and also the smoke, they tend to want to run away from that area. So that it would be hard to contain the crowd in that one area. The other option we looked at a shelter in place was uh, building a structure that could house uh, the guests. 
But that became a problem because that would have violated the CUP because they can't build something to meet the condition of the CUP. So that wasn't going to be viable either. The other option we looked at was uh, limiting the events to uh, off-season, during the off higher fire season. And that, uh, that, that's the letter that uh, you probably have seen is, uh, we said, from May to December, tends to we get fires. And uh, looking at the fire history in that area, we couldn't really determine a fire is kind of thing. We can't determine what days are going to be okay, what days it wouldn't be okay. And since weddings are uh, scheduled months and sometimes a year in advance, it would have been difficult to really meet that condition. The third option we looked at was a secondary access. And uh, secondary access was proposed by the applicant, but uh, I drove that access road, and the requirements of the secondary access is meet the condition of the primary as well, being the same. And when you drive the secondary axis, it's nowhere close to the primary axis. The width is much narrow in a lot of areas. Uh, the, uh, the pavement is dirt. And uh, there are a lot of uh, there are few uh, gates along the way, which they could be locked and uh, not accessible. The access uh, runs through multiple parcels that the applicant needs easement through those, needs to get an agreement to have easement or access through those. So it, it wasn't a viable solution for that one either. So in my mind, we explored the different options that we could have given the applicant, and none of them became practical. Okay. Um, maybe I, I wasn't clear. Um, thank you for that information. But what is the maximum number of guests that could shelter in place or there uh, could be a structure large enough to accommodate them? What's the largest number of guests that could be there? Depends on the structure they have. If they can build a structure that house 150, 150 would be the one. No, but you just said that, that they couldn't because of CUPs. Exactly. That's why I But the shelter in place in an open area, what is the maximum number of guests? I wouldn't know that because we have to run the fire model again to see. But you have to put the human psychology on top of that. Even the fire model, the computer will generate a number, but doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be... So we, don't, so we don't know the number, say, if something comes forward down the line, we don't know a number of guests that, uh, that could be accommodated there? I don't think so. We have to look at individual cases. In this particular one, if we run the computer model and say for the size of the area that they have, they can only have 40 guests, for example, or 30 guests. Uh, I don't know that number without running the model. But even when you run the model and you come into that number, you really have to take the human psychology into uh, into play. What are, how, do, how do people going to behave when there's fire around them? Do they want to get out of the area? So that's, that's the part that we, we can't generate by computer. We have to look at that more case by case. So um, ballpark, 50 guests? I, I wouldn't be able to give you a number. Okay. So I can't commit to a number and, and, and be held to that number because I really don't know. All right. Thank you. Mr. <coughs> Chairman. Go ahead. Hello, Paul. <clears throat> Explain something to me. Assuming for a moment this road was wide enough and so forth, but there's all these gates, and if you had access to these gates and had a key or whatever it took, I mean, is there a maximum amount of gates? I mean, that slows you down. How, how does that whole thing work with gates? Uh, actually, the secondary access has to be just like the primary without a gate. So the without any, a gate? Any, yes. Any kind of gate uh, will basically violate the secondary access. That has to be an open road and with the same width of the primary access, same construction as the primary access to be viable. Thank you. Commissioner Ansar. Well, I have an issue here. I, we, have an, we have an applicant who's requested a continuance based on a technical argument. And normally, I wouldn't want to go out of order, but I'd like to resolve the issue of the continuance and try to find out if there's some factual legal basis for a continuance. I don't want to pre preclude them from making an appeal if they can make an appeal. And if that's dispositive of the issue, that would be helpful for everyone. So my, I would like to discuss this issue of this appeal and resolve it one way or another before we proceed. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, um, we can go out of order here and have the applicant step forward because they requested, but I've gotten conflicting information. So at that point in time, um, then we can ask county council. So I'm going to go a little bit about order just for clarification. Uh, Mr. Friedlander, if you'd like to approach and give us some clarity on your client's position. So please state your name and address for the record. Yes, council. good morning, commissioners. My name is Dan Friedlander. 
address is 31355 Oak Crest Drive in Westlake Village, California, and I am the attorney for the applicant in this project. Uh, taking a look, and I'm assuming you just want me to address the appeal issues at this Correct. point. Uh, taking a look at Section 108.1 of the Fire Code, it gives the Fire Appeals Board discretion, as I noted in my letter, to hear to hear appeals of determinations or decisions made by the fire marshal regarding the application or interpretation of the fire code. And it allows the appeals board to hear what they term equivalent methods of protection or safety as proposed. Okay. So uh, our position is that the fire marshal made a determination that secondary access was a requirement under the code and has suggested a condition of approval along those lines. Now, if you go back and look at the code provisions that are being relied upon by, by the county, the fire marshal, uh, you look at section 103.1, which deals with proposed subdivisions. And it's clear by looking through that, that ordinance that you're dealing with developments, subdivision areas, and it uses the term proposed subdivision. And it talks about the subdivision of lands. There's no subdivision of land here. Uh, when you go back and look at section 503.1.2, which has now been raised in the staff report four and a half years after the application has been made for the first time. And that only applies to new construction or the use of property that requires an operation or construction permit under specifically sections 105.6 and 105.7 of the fire code. None of those enumerated uh, uh, categories are anything that's been proposed by this project. Now, you know, the fire department may have the uh, authority to request secondary access or other alternative measures, but there's no requirement that secondary access be imposed. In fact, we're, there may be sufficient, and there are sufficient other alternatives that have been proposed here. So, in, in that respect, the fire marshal has made a determination that secondary access is required or they won't support the project. That determination is appealable to the Fire Appeals Board. And I think it's of such significance that any determination on that is going to be of importance to this commission in moving forward on making its determination as to whether the project satisfies the general plan policies and the other requirements for approval of the project. Um, so to the extent that the Commission cannot find here today that we meet the general plan policies, uh, I think it's appropriate for the Fire Department to have an appeal, to hear our arguments, and either one, reject us outright after we've made the application and say you don't have a right to appeal, or say you have a right to appeal, let's hear the appeal, make a determination as to whether the secondary access is a requirement of the code, or whether you're allowed to propose other sufficient alternatives that will allow you to meet the policies of the county. Questions of Mr. Friedlander on this issue? <clears throat> I posed this, and you heard his testimony. Uh, how, is, how have you said anything different than what you already said in your letter? How do you answer what he said about the, the four uh, options that they did consider? Oh. I'll apologize to the Commission. I was just retained as of last week, so I can't comment on the specific details of the application, and, and that you know, our, our planner can do that, and so that's not within my area of knowledge right now. But I can comment on the legal requirements and my interpretation of the code as it is and whether uh, the policies uh, can be met. Thank you. County Council, uh, I guess, what, and correct me if I'm wrong, we're being asked to make a decision based on a recommendation by staff, which relies significantly on the representations of the fire department. Uh, what's being proposed in front of us is that there is a another process that would affect our determination. Um, I know it's within our power to, to continue. Uh, we certainly have that power. Uh, any input? Chair Westner, you're correct. It's within your power to, to grant a continuance, and the standard there is if, if you find good cause for a continuance. And in terms of the appeal, 
Uh, as you know, I rep represent the Planning Commission. I don't represent either the Fire District or the Fire Board. There's different attorneys from the County Council's office who represent those two entities. And so I, uh, I can't give you advice in terms of uh, uh, whether there's jurisdiction to hear the appeal or the actual merits of the appeal. And those decisions will need to be made by the Fire District and or the Fire Board itself. And so that's, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how that would play out, but that's the, basically the extent of the advice I can give you on, on okay. that issue. All right, then um, correct me if I'm wrong, Commissioners. What we have is we've been put on notice that there's another process that is essential to this conditional use permit as far as the, the planning staff's recommendations uh, for us to move forward without uh, letting the applicant avail themselves of that, uh, I think would be a little prejudicial. That's that's my opinion. Anybody else? I would like to know staff's opinion on the request for continuance. So, um, Commissioner Onstadt, through the chair, it's my understanding. You know, you know that we don't make recommendations for denial here lightly. We always try to work things out. Especially, you know, the Everts have been very good applicants and and have been working with the county all along. So, you know, obviously we rely on the fire marshal, right? He is the expert in the county on the interpretation of his codes, and he has a county council that he consulted with about this very issue. This isn't a new issue. It's an issue that was asked and answered in writing, as I understand it, by um, uh, the fire marshal through his attorney to the Everett's. So with that information, of course, we proceeded. Had we had any inclination that that wasn't the correct course of action, we wouldn't be here. So, you know, I can I can only rely on on Masood. You can you can you can continue right the, the hearing, and we can flesh it out further. We can get a formal opinion from the county council. You can delay the hearing for a while, and perhaps we can get someone from the county council's office to come down here and answer that question. Um, but it, it's it's up to you how you'd like to proceed. But you're saying you already got a letter of opinion from County Council on the issue, on the exact issue of the appeal, or that is that correct? So, uh, yeah, as, as I understand it, that we received that question was asked and answered to the fire marshal, and that he had consulted with his attorney, and the response back to us was that is not an appealable decision before that body. So we didn't look into it any further right. than that. That was just the answer that was given to us. Are you aware of that determination, sir? My understanding is that there was a letter that was sent to us by the applicant, by, by the county, suggesting that there was a, uh, an opinion that an appeal was not available to us. The, the problem with that is that we have not formally made the appeal yet because we knew there was a dispute over that. Um, and until we do that, we don't have uh, we, we haven't exhausted our administrative remedies there, and that poses a problem to us because if it turns out later that we should have done that appeal and we didn't, and the Planning Commission makes a determination based upon that, we, we've got some issues. Um, and let me raise one other issue um, in, in response to your comment uh, about, Mr., uh, about the fire marshal's comments. We are not requesting a waiver of anything in the fire code. We are simply suggesting that Secondary access is not a mandatory requirement, and that we are proposing uh, alternative measures that will still satisfy the code. So uh, we're not requesting that the fire code be thrown out the window and that it doesn't apply to us. Yes, uh, Mr. Freeland, if you let the fire marshal respond. Absolutely. <clears throat> I'm going to control this because of this appeal issue. I, uh, I'm serious about this one. Uh, Mr. Freelander brought up a couple of points. I just want to kind of comment on those. One of the uh, points he was asking, he was referring to a section of the code that this is a, not a, a land use or subdivision, therefore the uh, secondary access doesn't apply. As I mentioned earlier, in the fire code, and he's looking at the ordinance, which is fine, but the fire code itself gives a general broader uh, uh, latitude for us to require the secondary access. So that's so that that just a general police power for health and safety. Is that what you're talking about? Correct. It just because of the certain climatic conditions, it, because it could vary from project to project. So we have to look at and see what is required for this project. Now, 
Uh, the other issue about the waiver, uh, we have looked at other options. I mean, we, we have looked at their proposal. It's nothing new. Unless they have something new or uh, that they're coming up with a proposal, I'm willing to entertain. But the suggestions was already looked at, and we came back with those options that I mentioned earlier. And uh, basically, none of them was viable in that sense. Uh, as far as the county council, I t spoke with him last night, and he said he's available to come down and ask, answer any questions. So if that would help, uh, I, I would suggest, rather than delaying it, having county council perhaps coming in answer those questions directly. Oh uh, yeah, but the problem with that is they haven't exhausted their administrative remedies and the question to my mind is do we give them an opportunity to do that? To be formally dealt with. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm looking at page 5 of 12 that says the applicant initiated an investigation into whether or not the determination made about the secondary access was a decision appealable to the uh, VCFPD Board of Appeals and they responded to the applicant via email that they did not have jurisdiction over the matter. Um, and the reason why was because it was coming before the Planning Commission, is that correct? That's, correct. That's the, That was the determination by the County Council. So are these parallel, um, uh, never to meet uh, uh, lines of, of process? Or, or are we the proper body to, to hear it? That, that's a good question. Your, your commission is the proper body to, to hear. And you're, you're taking evidence now, and the fire district's giving you their interpretation, the applicants giving you uh, their interpretation. And, and so your, your role is to, to weigh that evidence and um, it's within your jurisdiction to, to do that and to make a decision today if, if, that's, if that's what you want to do. At the same time, um, the issue of a continuance is, is a little bit different, and, and there, it has been suggested, suggested there's another process out there. Um, and so um, theoretically, the fire board would have jurisdiction over that issue, even though it's unresolved. So. But, okay, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> it's clear as mud. Okay. Uh, well, I guess this is where we're at. Uh, just go ahead. Um, commissioner's absolutely correct that they said they didn't have jurisdiction because it was over in, in our domain. We're hearing now they never had the opportunity to formally be rejected or listened to, I should Probably say. Anyway. Okay. And if we proceed forward, then there's a question of they didn't exhaust what they had a right to exhaust. So. Commissioner Rodriguez. So is the applicant requesting a continuance? Yes. Yes. Until he gets up to I haven't heard that formally, but yeah. well, it's in the last. Well, well, I didn't. The last page. That's the last document last we got. Yeah. And the basis is the fact that the they did not formally apply to the Board of Appeals, and the Board of Appeals said it was in our jurisdiction, so. Yeah, it's a catch-22 well, situation. The, this get, in my mind, this gets to the the. We, we heard that, that there were four, the additional access, the shelter in place, the structure to house guests, or to condition it so that it is off season. So they had four, it wasn't simply they got to have a, a secondary access and that's it. They evaluated four different things based on that 125 guest number. And I was trying to get at, is there another number? Is there an, uh, something else that we can do to avoid the secondary access? So it seems like, you know, unless you change the project and then, you know, you start all over again. Yeah, but I think it's just, I hear what everybody's saying, but my, my problem is we're going to be asked to secure findings. Those findings are based on the information that we've all received. And now we've been told today that there is a formal appeal process that was never formally taken that has a direct impact back on our decision making. Which hasn't been waived. Or right. It's just... It, se it would seem to me the proper forum to flush this out is with the fire department. They have the expertise. Or they can just deny that it's not appealable, but right. we don't have that formal statement. We have an opinion. And I'm not going to cut somebody's process off uh, later down the road. Uh, you wanted to speak, 
Yeah. Name, name and address. Yes. Uh, and I'll, I'll please confine it to this issue. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Ginger Anderson. I'm at Penfield and Smith, 111 East Victoria, Santa Barbara, California, 93101. And the, the item that you're discussing and exactly that conversation you're having is and, and coming up with kind of an, an unknown is exactly what we've been going through. And we have requested the uh, fire department actually has two processes that we have uh, attempted to start. The first is a, an application that they have that's for alternative methods that's a lot, that allows you to propose alternative methods to serve your project. Um, Masood did provide that application to us and then was able to tell us that it was not appropriate to, to submit it. The second process is this formal appeals board, which is we feel, and in our presentation if we're allowed to make it, we feel that there are adequate um, alternative methods that will ensure the safety of the guests that include a public safety plan that include um, you know pictures of the site and of fire departments past use of the Everett's property for firefighting purposes um, there's a number of good uh, arguments to be made and information that we wish we feel that you should have to make a decision and uh, the item of a continuance if nothing else we would like our information to be heard even if your uh, Commission cannot make a formal determination one way or the other at the end of the day. We have several neighborhood members who are here to speak in support. We have several people who are, are here to oppose the project as well, and I feel that all of us has, have spent uh, an enormous amount of time and, and ha have a vested interest and would really like to have our comments heard. Whether or not your commission is, is legally able to make any kind of real uh, decision at the end um, that perhaps we can um, come back depending on how your your commission feels at the end of, of hearing all of this testimony whether you feel that uh, staff can be directed to go back and make findings or that we can um, uh, continue to pursue these other processes and then we'd also like clarification on at the end of the day whether your commission can compel the fire appeals board to to hear us or not um, so that's another question uh, I think for the attorneys and, and I wish that uh, you know, fires attorney uh, was here also today, but um, so I guess what I'm uh, I wanted to clarify that that request for a continuance is basically that I would like you to hear everything that we have because we have some really good information, um, and then at the end, if you're not able to make that de decision, that we maybe get more time to flush out those other um, uh, questions that you're discussing just now. So what I'm understanding is that you are not waiving any of your rights to formally appeal, but you would like to us to hear the merits of the situation. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Commissioners? Then give everyone an opportunity to I do, No, and yeah. we want to okay. accommodate the public. That's utmost to our thing. Um, commissioners? Okay. I, I'd like to uh, move ahead with the hearing, and, um, and if at the end of it uh, we need more information regarding this appeal process. Okay. But I'd, I'd like to move again, uh, move ahead today. Everybody feel comfortable with that? Yeah. No. No. Rich? No, I don't. Okay. Mr. Rodriguez. Well, I, I hear the concern. I hear where uh, Commissioner Owens' thoughts, uh, thoughts are. And I, I tend to agree with him, I think. But, but I'm prepared to go forward. Okay. All right, uh, so am I. Um, so what I hear is a, a four to one position. What I would like is uh, the county council that's available. Obviously, we're, no big hurry. We're gonna go through with the public because that will be a really the linchpin of this meeting today, to, in my mind, because I can't go on with the findings without. If we go forward with a hearing on the merits, is that gonna compromise the applicant? No, they they waived that. I, they requested it. That's one of the question I asked her. Council? Oh, I'd like to hear from him. You're, you're not. I'm sorry. That to respond to that question, um, it, it, it's not really a matter of waiver or not. It's, we've offered to present the commission with some additional information that may help it in determining uh, whether to, to continue the item or not and uh, what the, the issues are today. Uh, so I don't think there's any uh, issue of, a, of waiver involved. No, but what I was trying to represent is that you wanted to go forward, but there's still this issue of whether you have a right to a formal application to the fire board is still there. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would like the matter heard by the fire department first, because I think it's probably dispositive of what we would do or not do. 
uh, they're the appropriate body, they're the experts. I understand we have this parallel course set, but it seems to me that they should be allowed to exhaust their administrative remedies. Why they haven't done this before now or made a formal appeal, I can't say, but they haven't waived the right, there's no statute, and I think it properly belongs in front of the fire department with their expertise and make a determination and bring that determination back to us. It's getting the cart before the horse, as far as I'm concerned. I don't know what relevance will come from their decision, but it, are all these people going to come back and testify? I don't know, but I'd rather not take the testimony until I hear from the experts. Okay. All those in favor and continuing, say aye. 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 Opposed? Wait, conti continuing on, to, continuing it to a date further, or continuing on with the hearing right now? Could you continuing on the, the hearing it today. Oh, well then, I just want to know if you want to move forward, or you want to take the motion now to okay. rule it. I, I am in favor of moving forward today with the understanding oh. that if we need more information, we can get Correct. it later. Correct. No, no. I just want to know if to move forward with the hearing today. So I do not wish to move forward today. I want okay. the matter to continue. Oh, yeah. All right. So we're going to move forward on the matter today. Uh, I have one last question of staff, not related to. Um, in your presentation, you showed that the Königstein Road uh, was accepted, the county maintenance road network system by the Board of Supervisors in 1947. And you have two pictures that show one that's maintained to the county standards, and but further along the road, it's not. Whose responsibility is that? I believe it's the county's. Okay. Thank you. If you, if you need to change that, yeah. let me know. Certainly. What happens for what the purpose happens? of argument? Right that we follow staff recommendation here. Mm -hmm. They follow with the appeal and right. either prevail on the appeal or through litigation. Well, Your Honor, <laughs> you, Your Honor, but how would you rule on that? <laughs> I would wait and take care of the first business okay. first and then go on to the second. Well, there'd be the, we could have that discussion offline and we can get more attorneys in here and probably have seven different opinions but uh, you wouldn't have to if you continued the matter. i understand and your points taken however the majority of the body wants to move forward all right with that miss anderson you're the i assume you're speaking for the applicant and then i have uh, danny everett and mr friedlander again um you can all speak again or if you want to wait till we get to the end and respond but if you're speaking formally for the applicant again uh, give your name and address please Sure. My name is Ginger Anderson. I'm with Penfield and Smith, 111 East Victoria Street, Santa Barbara, California, 93101. Um, I will be speaking first, and I'll be handing it over to Danny. And Could you speak up? I can barely oh, hear I'm you. Sorry. I don't know which one of these is live, if both. Um, the project, as staff has discussed, is an application of Danny Everett and T.R. Taylor to host temporary outdoor events at their property at 12695 Koenigstein Road in Santa Paula. The original application went in yeah. to the... Can I'm you sorry. Not hear me? Hold on a second. Oh, I, ap I apologize to you. We got wrapped up in something. We, as a commission, have to make disclosures ah. as far as any ex parte or additional information not contained in the packet or to be received today in testimony. Commissioner Hayden? No disclosures. I drove the road when we were hearing the uh, Santa Paula oil field. Okay. So I'm familiar with the property. I'm generally familiar with the property, having been up and down Koenigstein Road all my life. No disclosures. I'm familiar with the area, Koenigstein Road. My apologies, Ms. Anderson. That's okay. Um, Thank you, was, Commissioner. I, uh, can I also ask the um, man in the booth or woman in the booth to put up my presentation? Um, as you heard, the original application went into the county in 2009, and we are grateful for county staff's help during this process and are disappointed to be here with a recommendation for denial of the permit, although we understand why that is happening. During the course of this presentation, we will provide an overview of the project and its location, various components of the project description, details on the potential impact areas, including neighborhood compatibility and safety, a timeline of key events uh, during processing. Those key points will include a highlight uh, of extensive correspondence with fire and decisions made throughout the process, including a reduction of the project and preparation of a public safety plan. Um, and then, like I said, I'll turn it over to Mr. Everett, who will go into his role in the community and a history of the project and the project site. 
Um, and then I'm not sure if we'll be going back to the attorney if he was going to cover the points we kind of already went over uh, previously. Um, we also want to reserve five to ten minutes at the end of public testimony to uh, rebut at the end. Um, I'll try not to read this all script-wise uh, so we don't get a uh, denial for being boring. Um, <laughs> here we go. So, uh, let's see. As you can see from the slide, the project is, uh, and from Michelle's slides, the project site is about 10 acres, four and a half of which are the CUP area. The, um, there are, is a smaller number of events, of events than originally proposed. We did that uh, through the process in coordination with the various departments, including fire. Uh, the limited schedule of events, which is uh, kind of unique to this application, is that it's a one, one maximum for any given weekend, and the number of in, um, events per month would not exceed two per month. The guests would be a maximum of 125, and that can or cannot include the staff of the caterers and all of that. It's, you know, we're flexible on that. Um, the number represents 50% less than what was originally um, proposed, and that number was proposed based on the available parking on site. So there's more than adequate parking available. Um, the proposal goes further in that my clients have, a, um, have permission to use a local uh, business parking lot um, as a staging area to shuttle guests up from that spot. The event start and end times are um, calls for amplified sound to be turned off by 1030 with guests and event staff off at, the, at 11. Um, the included in the project plan is a provision that vendors utilize uh, Vendors utilized for the event may come back on the following day. I know in previous um, hearings for special events, there's been question on whether you can really break down a wedding in a half an hour. So we have provisions for the next day or the following Monday that they're able to come between 10 and 2 and pick up their remaining items. Uh, let's see. Um, for safety, and I'll get to this lady, later a little bit in more detail um, in the next slide, is that there is a public safety plan that was prepared that has 13 items to ensure safety um, and uh, that some of them those some of those are duplicative of the 20 or so um, conditions for approval that fire had been able to provide us at various times during this process that kind of goes over what I just talked about the public safety plan this was prepared in May 2009 and updated again in December 2010 with input from the fire department. The Collings and Associates Fire Engineering um, prepared this plan. Al Yackel, the person who specifically came to the site and prepared the plan, holds degrees in fire science technology and business management, is a graduate of the Fire Academy. He is an ICBO registered building inspector and plans examiner and holds a California State Fire Marshal certification. He has over 20 years of experience in the fire protection industry, including fire code analysis, uh, fire and life safety systems review, building and fire suppression system surveys, inspections of projects under construction and compliance with approved documents, building commissioning, event management, and emergency planning. And in my, um, I'll be providing my comments to you at the end, so I won't finish reading his resume, but he's qualified. Uh, he also was the University of California campus, uh, used to be a fire marshal for a University of California campus. The public safety plan includes 13 recommended measures that the owners are more than willing to comply with, including a second 5,000 gallon water storage tank and a new hydrant. The hydrant would be located adjacent to the parking lot or in a location approved by the fire department. There would be a permanent sign at the fire hydrant stating it's a drafting fire hydrant of 4,500 gallons. It would be painted yellow, have a reflector, uh, there would be a hammerhead included, um, as Koenigstein is a, um, the single road, there would be a hammerhead turnaround per fire code. Um, there would be up upgrades to Koenigstein Road adjacent to the project site. There would also be a requirement for brush clearance along Koenigstein and around the event site. There would be fire, portable fire extinguishers provided by all vendors near all of their warming plates and other apparatus. Smoking would be limited to clearly marked areas. Um, nobody goes to a wedding intending to quit smoking for the first time. So there are two places on the site that would be designated for smoking and would have um, the appropriate flammable waste dispensers at them. Open flames would be prohibited except in accordance with the fire department's candle ordinance, uh, I think it's an ordinance or a standard for candles. 
There would be an emergency and evacuation plan prepared. There would be a safe dispersal area clearly identified with signs. Um, and I do have some site photos uh, in a separate presentation that I will, will need to have um, put up here in a minute. There would also be leasing agreements with provisions for an emergency planning and parking restrictions provided to all people that would have events at the site and an emergency pamphlet provided to all guests at those events. Throughout the application process, Mr. Everett and Mrs. Taylor have worked with all the requisite county agencies as required in the CUP process and have addressed all of the typical wedding event site uh, compatibility issues such as noise, light, and traffic. Uh, let's see. The project was circulated amongst those county departments who are experts in their field and uh, draft initial studies were prepared that showed that these impacts would be less than significant with mitigation measures and standard conditions found in most event condition application approvals. Um, we had a noise report prepared by Marland Hale and in that noise report he went through a um, an analysis of the area and came up with thresholds and a requirement for sound monitoring and that's a typical requirement that your board assigns to event events. Uh, he said that since the background noise he took into account that this is a very quiet area and reduced the amplified um, thresholds accordingly. Uh, the county has repeatedly made the required findings for approval with sound monitoring to ensure that the sound uh, is not significant. This is the initial study that showed that those would be less than significant impacts. Same with lighting. A lighting plan has been prepared in consultation with the planning division. The county has repeatedly been able to make required findings for approval with a condition for lighting plans. Again, the draft ISMND prepared showed that the impacts would be less than significant with mitigation. Visual resources. Uh, this is a very rural area and it's very beautiful and that's why it would be a good event site. Uh, visual resources other than lighting um, were found to be either not significant, well, not significant. In summary, there are a stack of conditions of approval to choose from that have been regularly applied for other event sites and we feel the same would be, could be done for this application. Uh, parking and traffic, similar. Uh, parking was found adequate to have a much larger number of guests. The guest, number of guests have been significantly reduced. County traffic and trans, uh, we talked about Koenigstein Road and the adequate um, uh, adequacy of Koenigstein Road. County tra traffic and transportation staff has reviewed the project at a higher number and with each round of review was able to find that the project had less than significant impacts to traffic and circulation. This is their initial study checklist, less than significant. Other resources, water resources, uh, surface and groundwater, less than significant. Uh, trash, integrated waste, less than significant. Ag compatibility, less than significant. Um, I can't, I think the other one is air quality is that lower left. And then uh, the fire department's initial study checklist, which originally had less than significant with those conditions that they were able to apply at previous times during the process. I'll go through the timeline and I will try not to get uh, too, too, uh, detailed. Um, my predecessor at Penfield and Smith, Jennifer Welch, met with the fire department and the Everett's several times over the past four years with communications through 2012, leading us to believe that impacts to safety could be mitigated to less than significant levels with assignment of conditions. It's typical for a process to be iterative, as it has been with this one. The processing has been longer than average, and we have essentially come to a stone wall where um, we, we are no longer being allowed to move forward. So bear with me, uh, I'll be starting with 2009. Um, let's see. A few months after, after application, the uh, com application was found complete with county fire, uh, county fire deemed it complete and applied 20 conditions for approval. Those included access for 20 foot access and 10 feet of brush clearance, vertical clearance of 13 feet six, turnarounds for fire apparatus at the end of the paved portion of Koenigstein Road prohibited parking on Koenigstein Road, uh, had a requirement for access road gates. There are no access road gates on Koenigstein between the 150 and this site. This site used to have a, a gate in the front and no longer has a gate, so there are no gates. Uh, required address numbers, which is typical. Uh, location markers for the hydrant, also typical. Uh, required the private water supply, as was 
also indicated in our public safety plan that there would be an additional 5,000 gallon water tank and fire hydrant installed. Um, that also would require water system plans to prove that the, the uh, fire hydrant would be um, serviceable and usable. Fire extinguishers um, installed in accordance with the code. Hazard abatement that brush be cleared within 100 feet of all structures and as well as around the temporary parking area. That's standard and the, um, the Everett's not only maintain their own property for fire hazards, they also go quite a bit off their own property and assist their neighbors in meeting those vegetation clearance requirements um, because they have kind of a hillside next to them that's um, owned by an agricultural use that they don't have interest in, in up there. Um, we're required to have a spark arrestor for any chimney. There are no structures in this project. Fire code per, uh, requires fire code permits where applicable. Um, prohibits smoking except for in designated areas. Um, it provides that exterior lighting shall be provided during events after dusk, that there would be security for events more than 75 people and an event coordinator on site during the events. So that's two people in charge of making sure that things are, are happening in accordance with the CUP conditions if we get them. Um, it specified that at no time shall the barn on site be used for an assembled occupancy. And this gets to that um, argument about a shelter in place. At one point we were uh, provided the opportunity to provide a shelter in place in the structure and we were informed later uh, that by RMA staff that unfortunately permanent structures are not allowed for temporary uses. And so we thought, well, maybe we can use, you know, have a structure, it can be used for uh, shelter in place, but it'll be also storage or a barn or some other allowed permanent structure. And we were informed that we could not, that a shelter must be designated if it is a shelter in place, must be only used for shelter in place and no other purpose at any time. So there was really no way to rectify those two, two items. Uh, we were required then to have a technical report approved by a specialist, which is the public safety plan. Uh, a week after that first um, complete letter by the fire department and those conditions, we got our first complete letter from RMA staff. A month after that, and for about a year, uh, the process was in suspense to alleviate some violations on the property that occurred. Um, I think some of them were by previous owners, and those were all a letter from the RMA division on September 17, 2010, indicated that all of those violations had been abated as of September 17, 2010. Uh, later that year, it was recirculated and fire added uh, another condition requiring sprinklers for all the buildings and structures, new buildings and structures, but again, we aren't proposing any buildings or structures with this. And again, this is this first fire protection initial study checklist with less than significant. And the memorandum that, uh, that talked about additional conditions. And it, I believe it ends with, therefore, the project will have less than significant impacts because the project will meet current fire district standards. This is a representation of one of the many times we met with the fire department on site. This was actually with uh, Masood's predecessor, I believe Larry Williams. He went all the way up Koenigstein Road and took measurements, oops, um, all the way up to, to show that, um, that it was of various widths and he was more or less okay with the way that the Koenigstein Road was and the condition then became to increase uh, the width outside of the uh, CUP area, which is um, the Everett's property. Uh, in November 2010, Fire, uh, let's see, that was the sketch. Which it, shortly after that sketch, another conditions memo came out from the fire department with 22 conditions. It referenced again the public safety plan. It broke out two of the conditions for brush removal from one into two. It added tiered levels of security based on event size and added event cancellation being the fire code, the fire official may cancel or restrict events during periods of critical fire weather as determined by the fire code official. We had meetings with them about this. Um, again, as Masood stated, there are um, typically brides will plan their event up to a year in advance, and it, uh, it's detrimental to, I think, the business, um, and it's kind of infeasible to have a last minute cancellation. Um, of course, if there was an active, um, an active fire or a, an active ac evacuation, uh, that they would be more than willing to, um, to 
cancel an event during those times, and I think Danny can talk more about that, um, what they're willing to do um, in his section. Uh, in December, Larry Williams uh, visited the site again and indicated that because the project was submitted prior to the adoption of the new fire code, the application would be subject to previous code requirements. Additionally, the fire chief reviewed the subject application and recommended clarification of the conditions. The conditions were the same as before, however, the gate um, on the property had since been removed. In 2011, the county issued a draft initial study that stated there were less than significant impacts to fire hazards. It included a discussion of the public safety plan and several re references uh, to RMA's interactions with fire and mentioned that the nearest fully functional and staffed fire station is only 1.7 miles from the site. There was an, uh, another new draft initial study in April 2010, which had the same issues and was largely the same as the previous draft, except it said that the proposed project would have less than significant project-specific and cumul cumulative impacts related to fire or not. Not that that was different, but again stated that. And also iterated, reiterated as before that the upper section of Koenig sign would be widened in front of the Everett's house. In June 2011, the county again contacted us that fire and agricultural issues had been resolved and brought up some traffic issues. There was another meeting in July to discuss all those issues. In August and September of 2011, there was a series of communications regarding what would satisfy the new fire department. And then I think Ms. Sue kind of went over those different things that we explored, the shelter in place, the less number of people, the secondary access, uh, those types of things. Um, in September 2012, uh, we had another meeting and the width of Koenigstein was not an issue, rather the road was one way in and one way out which became the issue. In September 2012, they were trying to work out a scenario where the project could be allowed and um, we were offered that the case could be closed because fire department requirements could not be met in September 2012. Um, going through, in November, uh, we attempted to meet again on site of 2012 and we were uh, essentially told that the secondary access had issues because of the, the gates and the, um, the level of improvement of the secondary access road. Um, mind you, those roads have been, and I you know you have just sat through the Murata project hearing that those roads have been used by oil machines, whether it was with or without a permit for a long time. So, those would certainly be adequate, and I'm sure that the Everett's could work out a scenario with their neighbors to, to have those gates put, you know, a Knox lock, a Knox box, or some sort of thing where that's typical um, from the fire department to make that uh, accessible. But even without the secondary access, there's several things that we can do, um, such as the public safety plan, and several things we've already agreed to that we think uh, provide an adequate um, and equivalent level of safety. So uh, let's see, Ventura County has the strongest weed abatement requirements. As I said, Danny and Tiarza have met those on a yearly basis and go above and beyond what's required. Uh, we recognize that, that there have been a lot of difficult projects um, in the region and that I wanted to point out that one of the opponents of that Murata project who had an issue with Koenigstein Road is here in support of this project. Um, Let's see, the owners have worked collaboratively with the county to address issues as they've come up so that people would be safe and that they wouldn't be a nuisance to their neighbors. This work has resulted in a project description that is a smaller number of guests and will there be, therefore be in keeping with the rural character of the community. They've limited the number of events, provided a shuttle, are agreeing to trash pickup and other light plans and other things. They are getting, um, getting to this hearing date has been a very long process. It's been a long time coming. There's been some frustration with it. Um, and there has been uh, additional frustration that I think Danny will go through regarding our, uh, we tried to meet with Supervisor Bennett about this and he declined to meet with us but was able to meet with some of the appellant parties. We were however grateful to meet with the supervisor staff, Steve Overman, uh, to, to kind of air out our concerns about the application. Um, so again, much of 2013 has been spent in an effort to regain the fire department support and there's been some back and forth with the county on, on various fees that we've worked through. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Danny. And um, then I would like to come back at the end to have some uh, additional comments just before, um, before public testimony. You know, the applicant always has the last say except for okay. staff. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Everett, name and address, please. 
I'm Danny <coughs> Everett, and my address is 12695 Koenigstein Boulevard. Thank you. I mean, Road. It's not a boulevard. Excuse me. Good morning. Good morning. So, I'm Danny Everett, and my wife and I are applying for CUP, conditional use permit for our property. Um, the CUP application number is LU, LU00, what was it? 090036. The application has been a long journey, and as you guys kind of, you know, in your short moments of listening to just trying to get through this hearing, the frustration in the beginning of trying to figure out everything and how to do it uh, was kind of apparent. And if you stretch that over four to five years, you can imagine the times and days that we were very frustrated at the process because it has felt many times that. Um, we've had to go in many different directions and had to try to hit many different targets and oftentimes the targets seemed like they were moving and wasn't consistent uh, with what we were being told and asked to do. Um, I would like to talk about my wife and I uh, and how we have uh, really made a place for ourselves in, this com in the community that we live in uh, and understand that when you're working with and putting forth a project and working with the county that we've worked very well together. It's been a great collaboration, at times frustrating, and there are times that uh, I have been angry. I know they have been times they've maybe been frustrated with me because I've been angry with something, but always, we've always been able to find a solution to whatever the issue was, and we've always worked with that spirit in this process. We moved here. Uh, my wife was originally was born and raised in Alaska. I was born in Texas, and I spent most of my younger years there. So certainly we have a great respect and understanding of the environment and outdoors. Um, we came to the Upper Ohio area in 1999 with the understanding and idea that we, it was a wonderful place to have children, and we since now have three. Um, and they are still small. Uh, where we are proposing to have these events, it is our home. It's not a weekend or vacation home. We will be living there. So as we are putting together our application, it's with that understanding that we are living there. And we understand that where we're living, that we have neighbors. Um, maybe not neighbors like other neighborhoods where our parcels are not so close together, although we are you know, human and we will understand that have impact on our neighbors. And that's why during this application process, it's a live document. Um, some of the things are already built into the application, um, like the number of events that you can have. Uh, those things we immediately um, cut down to half, always thinking of what would be best, not only for the community, but for us having small children. Um, and along the process and working with the document, um, it became a point where it, came, it became aware to us that there were people opposing the project. And we wanted to try to wait and speak to these things as we continue to work with the county to really put together the full application and full, the full information on the documents. Um, so there were a lot of times that um, things got a little, um, I guess uncomfortable in the neighborhood because there were notes and letters sent out with misinformation in it, uh, with things that were not set in stone. Uh, there were things put in the application based on uh, the amount of parking we had and the number of guests we could have because of that. But in looking at that and again trying to always keep our community in mind, we really modified and adjusted that for our final document that we feel really fits in and would not be an overburdensome, it would not be overburdensome to, the, to our neighborhood. You know, we, back in 2004, my uh, best friend's brother wanted to get married at our property. And he came and was married at our property. And that was the time that we had the idea that that would be a great idea, a great um, actually way to help support our family. Uh, is would be able to have events. I did come here to the building and ask, uh, was there anything we needed to do? I explained 
what our idea was. And I, the information I was given was, it's like having a private party on your property, so therefore you don't need anything. So with that information, we did have some events on our property and was beginning to start our wedding business. But um, we didn't really, we started having uh, events. We have, we've had parties and private events on our property for our f friends and family. Um, I'm a pretty good cook. Uh, being from the South and learning from my mother and my grandmother and father, um, when I say that I'm going to have a barbecue, somehow my little list of five to ten people can grow easily to 40 to 50 people. So there have been times that we've had several friends and family on our property having uh, our own private event. Uh, but like I said, we did uh, want to explore the idea of having our own business, of having weddings on our property. And we did have some of those events on our property. And around 2008, 2009, it became a big news item about estates having parties on their property without the use of a CUP. When we found out that information, we came in 2009 and started, maybe even 2008, we inquired in 2009, starting the process of getting our CUP uh, application started. But before we did that, my wife, with as many neighbors as we had contact information from, we reached out to them and asked and told them what our plans were. And we had, were very uh, honest and upfront. We were not trying to be decisive or sneaky neighbors and told our neighbors, this is what we are thinking of, this is what we want to do, we would have events on our property, we need a CUP to do it. And everyone that my wife spoke to, which was very, was quite a few of our neighbors, no one objected to it. So we really felt confident in starting the process of, uh, for our CUP. And when, when we first started that, I came and I, one of our first questions was to fire. Uh, and ask, this is where our location is. Do you see any, any reason that this would be a problem for us to even initiate the ACUP for this area? Um, I can't remember the, 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 the lady's name that I spoke to, but she did look up our property and our parcel. Um, she did some research on the area, and she informed me that, well, there's nothing that's glaring to me that would be a problem here, but of course we can't make any determinations until you actually put before us an actual application, which we then started. Once we started the application, there were several times that uh, we worked with FIRE, got feedback from FIRE, and every along the way, of course, there are things that come up, but there were always solutions. There are, they, we, even to the point where we have been deemed complete twice. Fire worked with us to put together a safety plan. We hired a firm to put together a safety plan of which fire accepted. And then later on, they came and asked for some revisions. We did those revisions and it was accepted again. And it, along the process, it, it always felt like Again, that's where sometimes the target felt like it was moving, but we always worked with them to get it to make sure that we were being very sensitive and aware of our area and making sure that they were confident in our application. It was only until we had done everything we were supposed to, we were close to ready to, to publish our findings and our project to come before you that fire came really and like I would say the 11th hour and 59th minute and the shelter in place then became the issue. Um, that became, that seemed like such a barrier that we just could not, uh, could not reach because then they were asking something that we were not able to do. And we were basically kind of stumped. At that point there was remedies tossed about of possibly looking into something that, well, maybe you can be reimbursed for some of the trouble you've gone through. And we had to put together a packet, which we did. It took quite a while to go back and look at all that. But once that was submitted, mm -hmm. it was denied. And thus, we started the process all over again. And after the shelter in place became unavailable, uh, that's when the secondary access came up. And I didn't quite understand 
with the, the, the secondary access because that was never something that was brought up before. And the, and the revelation that we had a road that was one way in and one way out, I wasn't sure why it took three, almost four years to finally say that that had always been the case. There was nothing in our safety plan that ever addressed that, or nor the feedback they gave us to ever tell us that that was something we should address or was a concern. I've had several people. Uh, we have a fire captain that works for uh, the federal government that lives on Koenigstein, and he has come to our property and seen our property and to realize, as the fire marshal said, you really should and look at it, individual projects in that light. And when you see our property and where it sits, uh, on one side of us is a cliff that drops pretty, probably about 50 to 60 feet down, and then below that is a avocado orchard. On the other side of our property is another property that is a avocado orchard, and then our other part, then the other our property is then flanked also by another property where Ventura County Fire used to, when the county owned the property, would come and set up their station to fight any fires that happened to be going on in the hills there, as well as using my own front driveway and back driveway, and that's a picture of uh, my uh, son when he was about four, I guess six or seven months old, sitting in the fire truck as they were parked in, the back, in our backyard. Uh, so the area is, in my opinion, and from the pictures here, whenever there has been a fire in the area, I, could, I couldn't imagine that a fire station would ever come and park their trucks in front and back and across the street where a helicopter would come and refill its tank that they would never put themselves in a danger that of a place that could be overrun or be dangerous in fires. Um, now since that open space has now also become, there's been avocado trees planted there, another orchard, and I believe that um, in Santa Barbara, one of the fire chiefs said that orchards are natural fire breaks. They are, it's very good to have an orchard around you, and we have a lot of open space and in addition to the, our property is another fire, another guy that I know from the city, um, fire came and looked at our property and he said that our very home is, could be even considered a shelter in place because it's stucco, it has a tile roof, our gutters are of the sort that he said was a very good thing and we have a lot of clearance around our house. So. Uh, it just really feels that it's nothing has changed in our project other than it seems like the attitude of fire somehow has changed and just put up this immovable, uncompromising position that over and over again they have already approved once to less than significant. At first it was the road that was the problem, then it wasn't the road, then it was the open space that was the problem, then it wasn't the open space. And now it's, it was a shelter in place, but then we can't do shelter in place. And now we're at secondary access, and we feel that even with that, they're not applying the thing, they're not looking at it and interpreting it correctly, or being collaborative as we have been able to do all these years, that it's now at the very end of this project, after we've invested a lot of time and money, that they are now just saying no. So I just, that, that was really what I wanted to say so just want to feel like the process has been worth it. I want to feel that the process has been fair and that um, it's not just someone coming and giving you a target that you, can, that you can't ever hit. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions of Mr. Everett? Yeah. Commissioner Dukas? You said you, you started uh, hosting weddings in 2004 and you stopped in 2009. Approximately how many events do you think you hosted? I'll make it correct. We had the wedding in 2004 was for my best friend was I my best friend brother but that that was a that was a like a family member I understand so but, but you your testimony was that that's when you got the idea so I'm just yes. wondering how many you hosted be in those five years we in in the five years we had probably about three or four weddings is is that total or well 
three or four weddings. Are you asking me that wasn't family members? Uh, maybe I need to understand the question. Are you asking how many weddings we had that wasn't family members? Okay, tell me how many were family members and how many were. We, we, had, we had about four weddings that were not family members. Uh -huh. And we've had, it wasn't, uh, and when you say weddings, it wasn't always weddings. We had, we've had parties. I said events. Christening. Okay, events. So we've had a probably over the years from since 2004, we've probably had 12 or 13 of our own personal parties. In addition to the four? In addition to the four, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions of Mr. Everett at this time? Mr. Everett, how many people live in the immediate vicinity? Now it's my wife and my three children. Uh, other residences in the area, roughly how many people use Koningstein Road as their access and egress to their residence? Just estimate. Um, I would imagine that the new... I would, I would guess we have about maybe 20 residents that live. I'm, I'm, I, have, I don't know how many residents we have live on Coniston, but I would say about 20. Okay. Is the current status of the project that you would shuttle all the guests up and back down Coningside Road? Or no, the, a significant the, portion of them, or what? No, well, it, was, it, was, it would be half. Half. Maybe half of the guests would, could come up and park in our back lot, and then the other half would be shuttled up. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Ebert, at this time? And also, I forgot to say that we also have, uh, we also furnish, and I know you guys got them, we got 56 letters of support from our neighbors. I know initially when the project was kind of going, we had um, people that were not supporting the project that wanted to speak on behalf of everyone on the Hill, but um, there are quite a few of our pe people in the community that support and know us uh, as responsible good people uh, that would do what we was what we have to do for our CUP and the guidelines that are set up for it. Okay, thank you. All right, it's uh, it's five after ten. We've been at this while. We're going to take a ten minute break to ten fifteen. And the other thing is, if you've parked in the parking lot as you exit the building, immediate to the right, there's a time limit of three hours. So I don't know when some of you got here or didn't get here. So if you're over there, you might want to park on the other side of the parking lot. So we'll return here at 10.15. My wife loved that picture, by the way. No. Apologize, we are complaining about the uh, technology now in automobiles today. So uh, we reconvened the Planning Commission. Um, the applicant was going to speak again. However, we have a constraint on the attorney County Council for the Fire Marshal, so we're going to allow him to speak, um, and then we can, we'll continue with the hearing. Mr. Ariana, name and address, sir. Good morning. Good Good meet morning. again. Uh, Roberto Ariana, Assistant County Council, 800 South Victoria Avenue. Which is my glasses. I live in Santa Paula. Okay. Uh, for the record, my involvement with, in this has been limited. I have a complete copy of what documents, code sections were followed if you want to go into the details. I can give you an overview and conclusion without doing that. If you want to spend the time to go through each of these code sections, I've got 10 copies, one for each of you, staff, council, I, I believe the that we have a specific question that might cut to the point and then we can go from there. Uh, Mr. Ansat, would you like to phrase the question since you dissented? No. Commissioner Dix. Okay, what, what we have before, what is, um, before us, is, uh, there's a process for appealing um, uh, conditions put forth by fire, and there's a process for coming before the Planning Commission. And we were wondering if it were, uh, if it was, uh, why it was deemed not appropriate to, f for the applicant to appeal the secondary access uh, condition and have uh, their uh, arguments heard uh, before it came to the Planning Commission or whether um, it's appropriate for the Planning Commission to to hear it instead and it's on a fast track for denial so we don't even have conditions of approval and if I if just to follow up on that uh, my concern is uh, concerned about due process in the fact that the uh, applicant has represented they have not formally requested the appeal nor have they been formally denied 
So that's kind of the conundrum we're in because our findings are going to be based, uh, if we deny, based on the representations of the fire. So, do, do we not have a representation that you intend to appeal the decision, sir, from the applicant? Do we have that representation? Formally. <laughs> No, Just to clarify, we did provide a letter in writing to the planning department that said that we wished to f go to the fire appeals board, and we got a response that said they had consulted with fire and that they said that it was inappropriate. So we have formally requested it, okay. but we were told that, that it would be inappropriate to do that. And my specific question to you, Council, is are you or are you not going to appeal the decision? But <laughs> Which decision? Are you or are you not going to appeal the decision of the fire department through the, that appellate process? If it is found that it is um, uh, appropriate and that we are allowed to, if the fire department says that we have a remedy with them, we will be pursuing that remedy with them. It's our intent to appeal the decision. Thank you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Roberto, now you know the conundrum we're in. Yes, and I can further exacerbate it. There, <laughs> <laughs> there is no fire department. There's a fire district. Okay. It's sorry, an independent sorry. public entity, and it has to have an appeal filed with it as a separate entity. Asking planning to do something or whether they can appeal is a different issue, different question. Planning did make a determination, which I have here in an email that went to Ginger, and a letter from Dan Clayman saying, Fire has determined that it's not an appealable issue. When I say fire has determined, that means the fire marshal, the fire code official, the fire chief, in essence, not the Board of Appeals for the fire code determinations. So there are two questions before you. Has there been a fire determination that can be appealed to that Board of Appeals? I mean, that's just an issue. You can't decide that. But that's at least a possibility. The fire marshal's position is no, because the code says for the Board of Appeals in 108.2, the board shall have no authority to waive requirements of the code or state law. The fire marshal's position is in the circumstances of this application, the secondary access is a requirement of the code because none of the other modifications would work. Under the state fire code, the fire marshal has the authority to accept and review modifications. The fire marshal has determined none of them are adequate enough for the protection of the public. The limitation in the state fire code and in the county ordinance on making modifications is the fire marshal must make two findings, that they do not uh, violate the intent or spirit or written letter of the code, and that they still uh, preserve the safety in the same measure as what is being asked to be modified. So the fire marshal's been through all that on this project, and he can explain it to you. I was given that hypothetical set of facts. Under that hypothetical set of facts, I advise the planning department, in my opinion and the fire marshal's opinion, no appeal would lie to the Board of Appeals for this secondary access issue. That's where we stood, I think, in March. But, but we've, we've heard from them that they do not intend to seek a waiver. Instead, they want to um, uh, explore this shelter in place, the structure to uh, house guests or uh, other other mitigation measures such as having an off season or reducing the number of guests that um, that they have that heard by the board is that appropriate or uh, possible my understanding is that all of those have been reviewed and rejected by the fire marshal so you're asking the ultimate hypothetical question could the board of appeals hear an appeal from the fire marshal's determination that none of those modifications will work without waiving the requirements of the code. I don't know the answer to that. But that wouldn't be my call anyway. I would be advocating the fire marshal's decision and another attorney, Joe Randazzo of our office, would be advising the Board of Appeals as to whether they had jurisdiction. We, no we are ethically walled off from each other on these decisions. We can consult with each other, but we Actually, are advocates for different entities. We want to make sure that, that they um, have due process and that, um, and that if there is an avenue uh, that is available to them, that, that, uh, that we not stand in the way. It's a novel question. There have been rare appeals to the Board of Appeals. My understanding, they're usually of substitute materials, whether sprinklers are required or not. 
That board has, I believe, an architect on it, a former fire official from a different county, not from our county or district, and I forget the third member's status. But the appeals they've heard traditionally have been very limited to, can we substitute these materials that are fire safe for these because the code and the policies adopted by the district may require one and they'll make a determination that they're equivalently safe. Uh, I don't know whether they could hear this. I can't give you an answer. I know the fire marshal's position, which I would advocate and have summarized for you, is that under these circumstances where the fire marshals make, made the determination under the code, which state code authorizes him, the secondary access is required, that they can't waive that requirement. And, and they do not intend to ask for a waiver, but they do have arguments that they can get the easements, that they can make the necessary improvements, that they can get knock boxes, and, you know, they have arguments. It's all tied together. Part of the fire marshal's determination that secondary access is required is his rejection of all of those. Thank you. Any other questions of the fire marshal's attorney? Thank you, Robert. We appreciate you coming down. Uh, if you need to, if you need to go, Robert, don't worry. Okay, well, well, welcome. You haven't seen enough of us in the last week, huh? Tell them we're not serving lunch. All right, all right. Um, <laughs> either Mr. Friedlander or Ms. Anderson, did you want to com continue with the applicant, or are you ready for the public hearing? Sorry, thank you for bearing with me. Um, I do have a couple more slides that were for Danny. These are uh, pictures of the fire department staging on his property that were taken. Uh, this is a picture of the helicopter. Um, they use a nearby knoll to fill up that, that tank. So this is a, a property that's, in my opinion, if this doesn't show it's defensible, I, I don't know. Maybe I don't know the, the definition or, or what have you. I'm not a fire department person. Um, this is a, a map that's in one of your letters of support. It kind of shows where the, the neighbors are. Um, we have letters of support from, uh, I think, three of those, and the fourth being the Everett's. Um, you can see it's a very large area. Uh, this is Danny and his son on their property. I'll leave it there for just a minute because it's so cute. Um, and then can we have um, my pictures of the site, please, now? So um, before we get into those, I just wanted to recap, we do have 56 letters of support. There are other sites where events are held that have one way in and one way out that are allowed. Um, as you've seen, it doesn't appear that the uh, planning division and the fire division's processes come together. Um, I think that might be something we can work on uh, in general, if not just for this particular application. Um, the project has been found to meet county policy, and we didn't get quite through the process far enough to find, have CUP findings for approval, but I think it would, it's my opinion that planning would be able to find those if fire was able to support. And our, just to be clear on, on what we're stating, um, we could, if, if we were allowed to use one of the existing structures on the site as a shelter in place, we would do that. Unfortunately, it does not appear that we're allowed to do that because of the requirement of a shelter in place to be dedicated solely to that use and RMA's policy that you cannot have permanent structures for temporary uses. So those, that's kind of a, a I think I've stated that before, it's, it's a, another sticking point for us. Uh, we believe there are adequate alternative methods to providing a full secondary access improved to the status of the first. We think that there are plenty of alternative methods that have been um, agreed to and, and are supportable that would be able to, for fire to support the project if, if we were allowed to, to, to make that argument to whomever the appropriate person is at fire. Um, just to recap, we have, um, let's see, we have a slide, oh, you know what, I missed it. Um, it's on the other one, but I won't make you go back. Uh, just to kind of go back into that discussion of um, the orchards in the vicinity and the open space to the east. It, it might be, I might have him pull that slide back up again, but it, it is um, a newspaper article that I found that related to the Gap Fire, where the fire marshal at the time was, or the captain actually was stating that because 
of those orchards in the Goleta area that act as a buffer between the wild urban interface that the use of orchards or the usefulness of orchards to prevent fire from coming down the mountain and onto this event site, that those orchards would help that. Um, and then secondly, I wanted to read a couple of the sections from the initial study, the draft initial study that was prepared by county, the county uh, planning division. The proposed project will have less than significant project related and cumulative impacts related to fire hazards because the project must comply with the 2006 IFC as adopted and amended and with the current fire hazard abatement. The applicant has a public safety plan prepared for the project in which the, the fire department has reviewed and approved and that the applicant is going to incorporate all of those recommendations into the public safety plan. In addition, uh, county fire would require conditions of approval that, rec that provide the public safety plan be prepared, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on basically that um, with regard to fire hazards, with regard to safety and tactical access, with regard to adequate fire flow, with regard to distance and response time, the conclusion was that therefore the proposed project will have a less than significant project specific and cumulative impacts related to the fire department, traveling distance and response times, uh, et cetera. Right. So site photos, so we know what we're, this is a uh, top left here is a picture of the park, proposed parking area. Top right is one of the internal access roads on the property. Um, lower left is uh, looking into some orchards adjacent to their property. Um, lower right is again uh, interior access, some of the interior access roads on the property. Here we have uh, top left is Danny's prop, um, house and front yard, some of the landscaped areas, and some of the paved internal access areas. Uh, some of the improvements and landscaping um, that have been, you know, this was all here when the fire um, safety plan preparer and when the fire department came out to look at the, the site. Uh, lower left is one of the um, water tanks on site. There would be a second one added. Lower right is a stone area that would be one of the smoking areas. Um, and then top right is a picture from lower on Koenigstein Road up of the house. The, ho the house is uh, dead center on that picture. And the point of providing that picture and some of these next pictures is to show that there is adequate line of, dis uh, line of sight distance, plenty down the hill. Uh, this is Koenigstein Road. The two left pictures are of the lower sections that are improved. They're, they're great. Uh, I've driven up there a few times. To the right where it narrows, it's still passable, it's still, and they are proposing to um, improve that. Uh, this is, these pictures are coming back down the road. You can see for a, lar a large area, and we think that that works as, um, you know, if there was a fire in the vicinity, that there would be plenty of warning for the people coming in or, or leaving. Uh, these are pictures of the orchards to the west, neighboring property to the east, uh, the lower left is a good, great picture of the open area where I believe is where the helicopters were um, picking up water, and this is directly adjacent to the, um, the Everett uh, Taylor property. Um, this is, as we were going to go, we were driving along the secondary access, and there was a State Farm insurance commercial on the top right there, a giant bull that's used for grading, grazing, and so that area is, is always very clear of, of hazardous vegetation. You can see that it's very wide open. And then you can see on the bottom right, some of the access road that's used, uh, I think primarily by some of the residents, but mostly by the oil well, uh, oil operations, that improving this access to the, to the standard of Koenigstein Road would be economically infeasible. There are gates and we could get, like I said, I'm sure we could get knocks for those gates in case it needed to be used. So that concludes my statements. Any questions of Ginger at this time? I'm hearing it. Uh, Dan, you can talk or you still have the right to talk at the end uh, if there's anything additional you want to put on the record. I'll reserve my comments until the end. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, of course. Nope. We'll see you at the end. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the reason you're all here and we like to see you here is the I will now open the public hearing 
Now, again, what we're going to do is this, the staff recommended action is denial. So based on what you've marked on your card, that's how I'm going to call you. So if you su support the recommended action, which is denial, uh, you will be heard first. Okay. If you uh, want to support, oppose it, you will be called after that. So with that, the first one is, and I'm going to apologize, I don't have my glasses, Margot Griswold. Name and address, please. Margot Griswold, 12138 Koningstein Road. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. And fire and safety is our utmost concern as neighbors on Koningstein. And I think with all the legal maneuvering and parallel tracks that are going on, you still have to consider as the fire department said, what is the response reaction to the people who are at the event when there's a fire? Imagine their confusion. They don't know the area. Imagine the residents who are living there. They may be trying to evacuate, coming down that road. It all looks very nice when there are no cars on it. Imagine what's going to be happening. And how do you get people out who are being shuttled? There's still a lot of questions in my mind about safety, and that's our first issue. Second, I would like to point out, we heard a very nice story from Danny about their starting, why they moved to our area. Similarly, I moved there because it's a wonderful, quiet, rural, open space. The Ojai Valley area plan, of which we're a part, amended in 2005, repeatedly states that needs to preserve, protect the character of the Ojai Valley and ensure and maintain the quality of life for its residents. So I would say that that's the Planning Commission's duty to consider the residents, uh, unlike Danny and Teresa who didn't consider the residents when they started in 2004, admittedly without their permit continued in 2005. Well, we're kind of laissez-faire up there. We didn't complain. We thought, okay, they're having, as they told their neighbor Charlotte, friends and family. But by the end of 2005, we started to scratch our heads. 2006 was worse. I think Danny's underestimating the number of events. So when I say that it's going to impair the quality of our life, it's not something that I'm imagining. I lived through it. And I have here in uh, September 30th, 2008, a note that was put in my mailbox. And this was the first conversation I had from Danny and Teresa. Just a quick note to thank you all. We've had a chance to speak with you regarding the parties we've hosted on the property. Although we're only hosting two remaining events this year. They already were advertising on a website. So I think they're a bit disingenuous with their history. And it's been a long history for the residents as well. Those of us who oppose the project. There are some that don't. There are many who oppose, who don't even live on Coney and Sign, but across the valley, who live west, who hear because of the way noise travels in our area. It's not a straight ahead, flat area with um, trees around it. It's up, it bounces, and I can tell you neighbors across the way, over a mile away, can give you every name of every person that was married there because they hear it that clearly. I get the traffic. I worry about that. Alcohol coming around the turn at the bottom of my road. I brought this up to the Board of Supervisors, to the Planning Commission in the past. I don't want to be the first responder in an accident. I've, I've done that before. It's, it's horrible. I think this is the wrong use for this site in this neighborhood. They point out the land nearby that looks very clear and open. That's because it burned recently. 
a few years ago. That's where the fire it zoomed through. They move very quickly, the fires. It's uh, frightening. It's not if it's going to burn, when we're going to have another fire. We have fires. It's a, we all uh, live with it. So I would say we need to consider safety first, not just for the people attending these events, but for the residents who live there now. And to be true to the Ojai Valley area plan, this is not a, a use that should be at a dead end on the top of a hill in Chaparral country. It's not the intended use. You have, of course, the discretionary right to grant it, but it's very disruptive of our residents' lives. Do you have any questions? Hey, Laura? You thought that, um, that he uh, misestimated or underestimated the number of events? I would say so. We can probably find dates and things over those years, but... Well, what's your estimation? Well, it started in 2004, there were a few. By 2008, there were a lot, like almost every weekend. I would estimate over that time, 30. And, and what months were they held? Usually in the months when it's nice, when we like to be outside as well. So in the spring through summer into fall. I might add that nowadays, after just experiencing that heat, the drought of two years, deep drought, not just a drought, two deep years of drought. When is it not fire season? It just is. I keep things clear. We all do. We all follow the regulations, and we've all hosted. I mean, the day fire, I had firemen from all over camped in, in my yard. It's not uh, unique to their property. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for your time, ma'am. We appreciate it. <clears throat> Mr. John Davis, followed by Lorraine Brown. Good morning, and thank you for the time. Name and address, sir. Um, my name is John Davis. I'm, I live at 12179 Koenigstein Road. Thank you. Um, I I'm, thought I'd be here. Uh, I am here in support of the uh, Planning Division's staff report. Um, but I think uh, during the course of this um, process, it's clear that the primary focus of everyone is fire. And as, as Margot said, uh, after two years of drought, it's very much on our minds on, in Konigs on Konigstein, which has a history of multiple fires in the last decade or two. Um, and there's, there's a record of fires reaching back to 1932 that had devastating impact in the area. Um, so what um, Danny is proposing from my point of view, is an, a new ignition source on Koenigstein Road. So not only uh, would these wedding events potentially cause fire, they're also um, potentially victims of fires that begin in other areas. In both cases, uh, it would prove highly detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, the notion of shuttle buses trying to pull people out from uh, the house at the top of Koenigstein, and at the same time, cars fleeing the site from, Koenig, from the top of Koenigstein. All the while, yes, the fire station is quite close by, but you, you get the picture. You know, you have emergency vehicles trying to go up what, what in some parts is essentially a single lane road, and you have people fleeing the um, Everett's property going down the hill who don't understand, are not familiar with the road, are not familiar with the conditions, and are under threat of um, fire. So it's not a happy story. I want to back up a little bit and say that th this particular uh, provision 
was initial, as I understand it, was initially um, proposed as a alternative um, source of income for farmers in the area. Now, I, I fully support that, and I think it's highly appropriate. But I want to point out that Danny is not a farmer. He, he no, makes no pretenses to be a farmer. So essentially, he's using a loophole in that provision to um, apply for the CUP. Um, I'd also point out that for all the talk of uh, how uh, fire safe he's made his property, if you saw in one of the photos, and I know from um, reality because I run past his property most days, uh, there are California peppers and mature eucalypts on the property, both of which are highly flammable. Um, I think that's about it. I, I, I can um, support uh, Margot's contention that this story goes back a long way and, and, and by Danny's admission it goes back to 2004 and he hosted illegal events for four to five years prior to applying for, to a, for a CUP which in my understanding of history he was pressured into doing by his neighbor who may in fact be speaking later today. Um, the other issue is what how will we condition this? It relies on the good uh, offices of Danny and his staff, and they have a history of um, being scofflaws, including, I might add, actually holding, event, holding a, a wedding event during the CUP process. I believe it was in 2010, uh, and we have we submitted evidence of that wedding event to the planning division at that time. So I don't believe we, we can condition it, we can, we can reduce the number of guests to 20, but that relies on who's going to police that. So I don't think we can condition this. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Any questions, Sir John? Thank you, sir. <clears throat> and thank you for the letter that you submitted a couple years ago. Uh, Lorraine Brown. Name and address, Lorraine. Lorraine Brown, 12179 Konigstein Road. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, as a resident and property owner on Konigstein Road, I'm in full agreement with staff's recommendation to deny the CU application based on the proposed projects in consistency with general and area plan policies. The fire and life safety issues have been at the heart of the extensive and concerned opposition to the CUP from the start. Um, Whatever the process has been, and I can't really comment on the nature of the process that Danny and Tiarza have engaged in, the bottom line is the fire and life safety issues. Danny regrets that he hasn't been able to reach a workable compromise with the fire department. Perhaps that be is because it is fundamentally an ill-advised project um, bringing hundreds of people to a dead-end site deep in the chaparral that is a potential source of fire, but also raises serious issues about the ability to evacuate um, that number of people um, from a substandard road and without a secondary access, um, ingress or egress. Um, so I do um, appreciate the thorough analysis that planning and fire department staff undertook, the conclusions they reached, and the recommendations they are making. Um, however, I also want to go on record as questioning staff report's suggestion that the proposed project could be conditioned to address issues of compatibility with the character of the surrounding and legally established development and interference with adjacent residential and agricultural use. Staff has chosen not to offer draft conditions as they are recommending denial of this application, so I don't wish to take time in today's hearing um, to provide to address that with any specificity. However, should today's hearing not prove to be the end of this ill-conceived project, I and many concerned residents of the Upper Ojai Valley do wish to retain the ability to address our other concerns, noise and light pollution, traffic, wildlife protection, and maintenance of the existing rural, primarily residential character of the neighborhood should the need arise. Thank you. Any questions of Ms. Brown? 
thank you for your patience. We thank, appreciate it. Okay, uh, now we'll go to those that oppose the recommended action, which is denial. So you support the CUP. The first one is a Harriet, Harrietta Jump, followed by uh, Trixie Scantlin. <coughs> Name and address, Harriet. Okay, Hon Honorable uh, Commissioner and members of our commission, my name is Harriet Jump. I live at 12727 Koningstein Road. We have uh, been on Koningstein Road since 1993, and we have uh, enjoyed that area very much. It's beautiful. I would like to state for the record that I would like to see this project go forward. I believe that uh, the efforts have worked in good faith with the county trying to mitigate and work through the labyrinth of technicalities that are always placed in front of uh, anyone doing something in the county. And it's a, a job I can only liken to a large ball of yarn and you're trying to find the end of it of where to start. It's almost impossible, and you almost take the scissors and just cut through it to get an end and a start. Uh, the Everett's have always worked in good faith with us. They have kept in touch with us. There seems to be a group of concerned citizens of Koningstein Road, and they seem to work in, what can I say, a vacuum of their own party, and they do not talk to us. They do not talk to several of the people who live in that area. Our home is across the canyon in direct eyesight, direct line of noise. Um, everything we can do, you can almost take your binoculars out and see what's going on, vice versa. I see no problem with this. That area up at the top where the uh, Everett's live has always been very flat and available and vegetation does not grow. When we talk about deep chaparral, yes, that does occur, mostly around my house. And when we had the ranch fire, we uh, stayed there and we managed and we never had a problem at all. Yes, you have people that are coming to this wedding or any of these weddings, and those occurrences have been few, by the way, I have to say that. And most of the people, as far as noise, I think that you've all instilled in building regulations, double-paned windows. We don't even hear it when it rains when we shut the windows. And the noise level is within the boundaries of what the county has provided for uh, decibel level and for when they turn off the noise. We have, we have no problem with them, and I am under the impression that this is being drowned in all of these legal ramifications of where one hand doesn't know what the other is doing. And we've experienced that before. I would like to see something happen that does not limit what people are doing up there. And this is not a common occurrence. I don't understand what is happening with your neighbors that you can't share a beautiful area with people who want to get married. It's, it's limiting just by the amount of people who want to do that. I have written a letter. I don't know if you have that in a packet in front of you. I would hope that you go through those things that I bulleted and put down paragraph by paragraph. Uh, my husband's a botanist, biologist. I have a degree in biology. The impact on nature is not happening. It's just not there. Uh, noise level is within tolerance of anybody having a party. But I think what's really noticeable is if the fire department could come to some sort of understanding. And I think they have, and then they back off and they throw more hurdles in front of anyone. I'm not just saying the Everett's in this case, but I'm saying anyone, then they have new things that come up. And that is very difficult for a citizen to deal with, very difficult. I um, 
uh, the gentleman who just spoke before, their house is up for sale. They're leaving. They've had their house up for sale for a long time. And I think this becomes a vindictive procedure where uh, these people have really worked with limiting what's going on. And uh, we, we have an adequate access up and down that road. And there's definitely adequate parking at their place. And I would like to see that go forward. I don't see a problem. If you would look at the map that I submitted also that shows the distance. I mean, the, we have people who live up there, yes. But you cannot even spit on their house. They're that far away. Distance is huge. It's not like when you are living in a city. We have big space, a lot of space. And it's like I I'm said, laughing because I'm trying to imagine, how far can this woman spit? <laughs> you, you can't. That's what I'm saying. I can't spit on my neighbor. Not that I would. But... but. But you know, you'd you'd have to walk a long ways, spitting distance, to get close to their place. So I, I I find this very sad, and the impediments for the common citizen using their their property becomes limiting. I appreciate your time. I uh, would hope that you read the letter that I submitted. I would hope that you look at the map that I submitted, and. I thank you very much for your time. We appreciate your time, Ms. Jump. Any questions of Elizabeth? Do you have no. any questions? No. Nope. Again, thank you. <clears throat> Trixie Scantlin. And that's all the speaker cards that I have. If there's anybody else, uh, please let me know after Trixie talks. Name and address, please. Uh, Trixie Scantlin at 12619 Konigstein Road. Um, we've probably been up there longest of anybody. We've been there since 1977. And yes, there are fires occasionally, but it's California. We have fires. We have to clear our property 100 feet around all structures. And as I say, we've been there quite a long time and lived through several fires. And I support uh, Danny and Tiarza to have this. A friend of mine uh, had their son's wedding up there a long time ago, and um, they said it was beautiful uh, I don't I'm sorry I'm not used to speaking in front of people so anyway um, they and it was uh, with a lot of grace and charm and I would hope that the Planning Commission would give grant them to have a business in our country of the free with free enterprise thank you thank you sir so, uh, any other speakers just give the clerk the uh, card Your name and address, please. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Mary Ann Ratcliffe. I live at 14145 Ojai Road. I own property directly adjacent to um, the Everett's, and we plan to move there um, someday. I cannot speak more highly of um, Danny and Tiarza. They are the most neighborly people you could ever imagine and have done so much for our community, <clears throat> above and beyond really what, what most people would do in terms of volunteering for our school in terms of caring uh, for their neighbors, um, in terms of um, preparing meals for when people are sick, and um, taking care of um, our, our children, and then always having our best interests in mind. And this is as direct neighbors as my experience with them. <coughs> so I cannot speak more highly. And when the whole issue of the CUP came up, I um, just encourage all of my neighbors, and I, and I respect everyone here, those, those for and against um, this issue, that a CUP is an opportunity for a discussion about our differences or maybe our goals and how that we work to how we work together. And I know that Danny and Tuyarza have made every outreach effort to, to speak with us. I know that there was concern that was that was generated. And so um, one of our <coughs> a couple at the at the base of Koenigstein Road went and um, had concerns. And so they spoke directly to Danny and Tiarza and their concerns were allayed and they now support the project that is before you. Um, I, I, just from listening, I think that the appeal to the fire district is completely appropriate. I know in other property that, that we've had, there are um, individual circumstances that cannot be addressed in one uniform code, and there are specific things um, unique to every single project. <coughs> that is what an appeal board is for, and we've been through that process, and I, 
Um, I think that that's absolutely appropriate. And then I am concerned about moving goalposts um, for, for projects that anyone um, in Ventura County has to face. There are so many things to, um, to um, fulfill in terms of the requirements. And then to have those goalposts um, keep moving um, seems grossly unfair. And I think it's <coughs> been demonstrated um, time and again in, in this process. Um, and, I, and I do question whether the fire requirements are applied evenly um, when I consider other projects. And I don't know the details of these, so um, I can't speak authoritatively. But there's the Creek Road Winery, a one-way access. There's the Ojai Valley School. There's the Happy Valley School. I know that those have some of those. I'm not, not Ojai um, Creek Road Winery, but I think some of the others, Thomas Aquinas College, Ojai Valley School, Happy Valley School in the immediate um, area do have other egresses, ingresses, but certainly those are not <coughs> the same as the primary access as is being stated as a requirement in this case. So I would ask that, um, like I said, I'm not speaking authoritatively on those in any way, shape, or form, but just as a, a layperson's observation. <coughs> Again, I have respect for all of my neighbors. I really think all of these people are wonderful. We all depend on each other um, and care about each other. And so I don't mean any, um, any disrespect to anybody of my, of my neighbors, but just to say um, that the CUP process is a discussion um, that I value in our process. And I really value Danny and Tiarza and that what, a, what an enormous asset they are to our community. And I think their project um, with concern for their neighbors is only going to um, benefit our area. The last fire um, that I can think of in the area that affected the Upper Ojai, obviously it was 1985, and then there was 1999 that did not um, go on to Koenigstein Road, as far as I recall, and the fire crews do stage um, right there. In that area. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other speakers that would like to? It's, I have the lady down. Give the clerk a card so we can call you up. Good morning. Good morning. Name my, and address. My name is Deborah Scantlin. I live at 12619 Koenigstein Road, Santa Paula. I want to clarify that we do not live in the Ojai Valley. Okay. <laughs> I'm here to support Danny and Tiarza. They have been neighbors of ours for many years. We live directly across the hill from them. We're just about even. We can see their property. If there's any noise, we can hear their property. Nothing really bothers us. I don't hear anything. I don't see their property is always well kept. There's never an eyesore. I don't see any problem with them having events. And I am a little disappointed in the county for giving them goals and having them meet those goals and then moving them again. And it really scares me that if in the future I would like to do something that the same thing would happen to me or any other citizen. Um, that's about it. I just want to voice my support. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Is there somebody else? Yeah, please give it to the clerk. And I think you already know name and address, please. My name is Charlotte Schmidt, and I live at 12599 Koningstein Road, um, approximately uh, 900 yards from Danny and Tiarza. And um, I built my home in 2004 and finished the house. Um, uh, my concern is the fires um, and also the noise. Uh, the parties that they had were, we go out at 10, 11, 12, 1 o'clock at night, and it would be like Dodger Stadium. The noise was so loud. Um, but mainly the fires, uh, we went through three fires since we built our house, and uh, we began building our house in uh, the late 90s, and we finished in 2004. And we bought the property in 1996. So we went through three fires, and one of the fires uh, were, um, oh, we probably had about 10 fire trucks on our property. And they used our fire hydrant and our well to fight the fire that also went to Danny and Tiarza's house. And so um, the, I don't know where the fire department is getting their water, because I don't know if that whole area on the 147 acres has any water in that area. So we're all on wells, all of us. 
We don't, we don't have uh, lakes. We have wells. So that's our main concern is, is the fires. And, um, you know, and I wish them the very best. I'm, I'm really concerned about the fires. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. All right, I have no other speaker cards. <clears throat> so therefore, it's the applicant's turn. Who'd like to go first? Hello again. Your name for your record, please. Ginger. Again, I'm Ginger with Penfield and Smith, 111 East Victoria, Santa Barbara, 9301. Um, in listening to these, uh, to to the testimony, um, I appreciate that everyone was able to come today. Um, I, I heard a couple of things. The first was that there would be all this traffic and people trying to evacuate. Um, I believe I read about the park fire that that they were uh, evacuated, but allowed to go back to their home on the same day within several hours. Um, and then with, with all these people, um, how are the people at the event site going to come down? Well, they're going to come down in the shuttle bus and they're going to come down on their, in their personal vehicles. And so half of 125, so I'm really bad at math, 60 something or other people. Um, but by the time they were, you know, as the, as the t you know, speaking of the mechanics, by the time those people at the top had come down, I would think that the people lower had already gotten out. Uh, regardless, it's been seen by the Traffic and Transportation Department, and they've determined that the traffic would not be significant um, for these events. Um, with regards to meeting the intents of the Ojai Valley Area Plan and other applicable plans and policies of the Non-Coastal Zoning Ordinance, planning has been able to make the policy consistency analysis for wedding sites in the Ojai Valley Area for event sites that are much larger, that have a lot more people in them. Um, uh, one of the speakers talked about where the supporters or opponents live. We have 56 letters. Some live on Koenigstein, some live further away. Um, with alcohol use, I think you've heard that argument before in event site, um, event site uh, applications. And again, that's a behavioral and a sheriff item. And the sheriff has weighed in during the initial study and was able to find that this event or that this project would have less than significant levels of impact. Um, as far as being uh, disruptive and the conditions of approval and whether or not they would comply with conditions of approval, the CUP is their contract with the county. And there are conditions of approval if we are allowed. There would be conditions of approval that would limit their use to the times, so would, would um, limit the time allowed and all of the events would have to be out by 1030 so it wouldn't be a midnight at Dodger Stadium. We also have a lighting plan that would be string lights, low reflective, that would be approved by the planning department. So again, that's all part of the process. Um, and that would be their contract with the county and therefore, and as part of those conditions, it's my uh, recollection that the county has a standard condition whereby the applicant pays to a deposit account and that account is set up so that if complaints are received, that the planning department can pull from that money to investigate those complaints. And that as a conditional use permit is a discretionary action, that if they do not meet their conditions of approval, that this commission could remove or revoke their application. So the, the thought that they, would not, that they would be freewheeling and not meeting the conditions of their code, I think that other of their neighbors have been able to speak to their um, citizenship and our process has safeguards to ensure that good neighbor actions. Um, for people not familiar with the site, that those are two, there are two conditions in the public safety plan that we had prepared. The first was that all people that would have an event at the site would have a contract and part of their lease with the Everett's would indicate you are in a high fire area and this is a, a danger to you. Um, that would be the first step. The second step would be providing the, all the vendors with that same information. And the third would be that the public safety plan had within it a provision to provide all people arriving at the event with a pamphlet and signage on site. This is where you park. This is a high fire area. This is where you're allowed to smoke. There are two people here to enforce those rules and not that it would you know, be a, a buzzkill to the event, but that would be something that they were provided upon entry of, to the event. Um, let's see, uh, we talked about evacuation. There is somewhere in the conditions that were proposed at one time where there would be an evacuation plan. I'm sure Danny and Tiarza would be more than happy to prepare that for review by the fire department. And let's see, uh, as far as the other impact areas, we've already gone over that. The project description at a much higher number of guests was circulated amongst all of the county departments and all of those departments with the exception of fire. 
uh, at the end, but they were in the beginning, uh, able to find that this project would have less than significant impacts. Um, wedding uses are an allowed use in the open space zone. Um, event uses have been allowed. Conditions have been able to be made on other sites. And as far as the water um, item that came up in testimony, uh, reading from the end of one of the initial studies draft, with regard to adequate fire flow, this project will have a less than significant project specific and cumulative effect on water supply because water supply for fire protection will meet the ordinance. The subject property has an on-site private water supply that is double in volume than what is required pursuant to the fire department standards. Anybody else? Questions? Nope. <clears throat> Council, just state your name again so the record. Just to be aware, there are other people listening throughout the county system. And, oh, I'm sorry. We do have a question of Ginger. So that's why we keep asking you to put your name so they know who the speaker is. Ginger? Uh, did you state that um, if there were to be a fire during one of these events, that half of the guests would be evacuated by shuttle? Half of the guests are proposed to be brought to the site by shuttle. It is then thought that they would come back in the shuttle as well. Um, there are also, you know, again, these are things that we would like to be able to discuss further with fire department, that there is a, an area where there's a huge open space where they could be. Uh, but yes, uh, half of the guests are proposed to come in a shuttle. It is thought that they would come down in the shuttle. Thank you. Okay, council. Name, please. Dan Friedlander, attorney for the applicant again. Uh, I'm happy that Robert Ariana was able to come uh, and give his testimony. And his, his testimony is consistent with my conversation I had with him yesterday. Um, at a minimum, there's a question whether it's appropriate to appeal to the Fire Appeals Board. Our position, of course, is that it is appropriate. Um, and it, I think it would be helpful for the Commission, just for your information, that, that I read that portion of the fire code into the record. Uh, this is section 108.2 entitled limitations on authority it says an application for appeal shall be based on a claim that the intent of the code or the rules legally adopted hereunder have been incorrectly interpreted that the provisions of this code do not fully apply or an equivalent method of protection or safety is proposed so you know considering the determination that was made uh, I suggest that it's appropriate that this matter be heard by the Fires Appeal Board so that the Commission can then make a decision based upon the merits, uh, at least have more information in front of it as to when the general plan guidelines have been met or can be met. Um, you know, Mr. Oriana discussed that the Fire Marshal has made a determination that it's not appealable, but what that's basically saying is I, as a Fire Marshal, have made this determination and you can't appeal it. So it's only the appeals board that can really make that determination of whether to accept the appeal and hear it or not. Uh, I have no further comments other than that. Any questions of counsel at this time? Okay, then, then why haven't you? Why haven't you uh, uh, gone to the, um, the appropriate appeal board then? This is a process that has been underway for a significant period of time. And like I said, I've only been involved with this project for a week, so maybe uh, they can answer that question better. But, you know, we've been trying to work with fire for a period of four and a half years. Um, you know, things took a turn at a certain point, and ultimately uh, the decision has to be made whether to appeal. That decision has been made. What, what point was that? When did that occur, when you thought things turned? Uh, I'm Ginger with Penfield and Smith again. Um, to answer the first question, um, and I think I said it before, and, and it's we were searching. Um, we had gotten to a point in the process where it seemed that uh, the secondary access was the basically the end all. That if and, we couldn't and provide, and when was that? That it. Well, they told us that a number of times. Um, I believe if I went back to my uh, timeline for you, I believe the first time um, was perhaps in, and again, uh, Jennifer Welch in, in my office uh, was working the pro project before I came in, became involved in October of last year. Um, 
I believe the, the first maybe indication we got that there had been a change at fire was when we talked to Larry Williams on the site in November 2010 that the fire code, I'm sorry, that, uh, I'm sorry, December 2010, that because the project was submitted prior to application of the new fire code, which I believe is where the secondary access came in, that the application would be, uh, that this application would be subject to the previous code instead. And then I believe that the first time that it, uh, that kind of flopped from that the road is a one-way in, one-way out um, as an issue and the, the width of that to being able to provide a secondary access perhaps was in September of 2012? Yeah, that's, that's yeah, Danny does have a couple of uh, other questions and I think he'll be able to, or not uh, statements, but I think he'll also be able to answer that more clearly for you. Okay, because that wasn't clear for me because I've, gr I've written down here December 2010 and then I've got September or October 2012. Right. So when was it that Let's, let's have, because Danny was consistent through where I'm sorry, I was not. Your name for the record, uh, Danny. Everett. Thank you. Um, the diagram that you saw where you saw the handwritten uh, diagram of our street, uh, that's when the new code came into effect about secondary access. And Larry Williams came to our, physically came to the property to walk the road and make a judgment on if he thought that was going to be an issue for us. Um, he drew that diagram and then told us that it would not, that the road was okay. Initially, there was a concern about the road, but when he came and made that diagram for us, it was, it was fine, and our process continued on. And then uh, we were deemed complete, and we, our, our um, application was going to start go public. I think they were pulling all the things together to send out to the neighbors that within 300 feet and, and to interested parties. And in August or September of 2011 is when we got hit with the shelter-in-place uh, argument, and that stalled us for a while. And then when it became clear that the shelter-in-place and the instructions were being given about that was, were unclear, and we finally got it cleared up several months later, um, that's when, the, in 2012, is then when the secondary access came up. So uh, September 2012, uh, you learned that uh, all of the other proposals for, for fire safety uh, weren't deemed appropriate. Anymore. Uh, Anymore. It, originally, when Larry Williams came At up that in, point in time? Yes. So between September 2012 and here we are in August 2013, how did you appeal to, how did, why did you not appeal to the appeal board of the fire district? Because they said it wasn't appropriate. We were trying to work with fire, and we were trying to work it out, but they said since we were not submitting our application to them, it was through planning, they were not denying our project. It was planning, denying it based on their recommendation. And we asked, and that's, that was the email I believe they showed earlier, that said that it would be inappropriate for us to go and appeal. And that's why it felt unfair and it felt like it, we've kept, have been through many iterations of things that were told to us were okay, then it wasn't okay, then it was, and then wasn't, and now we're at this point where now it wasn't. And then the other things, I just wanted to comment on some of the things for what our neighbors that Yes, fire sounds like a very scary word, and fire is very scary. And I want to point out once again, we live there. We have three children there. We are not trying to set up a situation where we would put ourselves, our children, or any of our neighbors in harm's way. I think our, even the people that spoke against our project admit, and we all do, we take extreme care in keeping our properties clear of brush. We take the weed abatement very seriously. And you know that if you follow weed abatement, you can even ask anyone in fire that if you are doing the proper things and you are planning, that is what make you that's that is what makes you safe. We all do that. We all make sure that. And in addition to that and above and beyond, we've put together a safety plan. We've put together things in place that are going to help Word against that. Just because you have people at your house 
And even if you have 50 or 100 people at your house, at a place where we live, where it's open space, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden a spontaneous hellfire is going to come roaring through and we all perish. The fires that we have lived through, and we've lived there on the property, none of those fires caused mandatory evacuations. None of those fires caused panic on the hill. There was never congestion on the hill. The firefighters were able to come and address the situation by staging on our very property, as I stated before, and on the adjacent property, and we were all safe. Structures were saved. No one lost structures or their homes. So it, it is an area that's very defensible. We're very responsible. I volunteer at our school. I'm there at three to four times out of the, out of the week, there with the kids. I volunteer in Ojai as a coach with Ojai Roadrunners. I, I volunteer at Oak Grove School because they don't have a track team, and they had a young man, that one young man that wanted to run track, and I offered my expertise to go there and actually help him run so he can actually run. So I have a great affinity for children. I have a great affinity for keeping people safe. I'm not an irresponsible, nor my wife or our family are irresponsible people. My neighbor, Charlotte, she's, she's correct. Although she opposes this project, we're very friendly with each other. It's, not, it's okay for people to have different opinions, but I just really want to deal with facts and deal with things that they know. I'm sure she can say that a very responsible person. She's a very responsible neighbor. I know she has mentioned she wants to do a dog kennel, and we know that when and if she ever does that, she'll be very responsible. We trust her, and we just ask that our neighbors trust us that we will follow and do and work with the county to make sure that we put together a plan that will keep people safe. Thank you. Any questions of Danny? Council, any additional words? Uh, just <clears throat> two additional points in response to your question, Commissioner. Uh, it was only very recently, within a, two or three months ago, that we received an indication from, it was from a letter from planning, that the appeal was not appropriate based on their discussions with fire. The other thing is, just a few days ago in the staff report was the first indication that fire was relying upon section, I believe it was uh, 501, as the basis for requiring the secondary access. So, uh, you know, we have avenues for appeal based upon decisions that were just a lot more recent than those that were made uh, you know, when the first indication of secondary access was becoming an issue. Okay. Any questions? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we've heard from the applicant. Now we'll talk to staff. <laughs> so uh, would you like us to take the fire marshal first, or does the planner want to make any comments? I, I have just a couple of overarching comments, and I'm sure that Ms. Sudan and Dan and Michelle both want to speak to you. But I, I heard two things that I, I really want to be clear to address. I, I heard um, somebody say that there is a loophole in the code and that the Everett's are applying under the loophole for ag promotional uses. So I really wanted to be clear on that. That's not true. They're not applying for a loophole. They never said that they were farmers. There's two separate and distinct sections in the code that you can perhaps get a wedding venue through. So the section that they've applied for says that it's a festival, animal show, and similar events, temporary outdoor. That is separate than what you can apply for also through a conditional use permit that is called ag promotional uses. So they didn't apply under that. So I just wanted to be clear on that point. And then I just wanted to take a moment to, to perhaps um, educate just a moment for what the code uh, calls out as accessory uses. So not all weddings that you have at your house requires a conditional use permit from the county. So obviously you can have weddings for people that you're related to or if your best friend gets married, things like that. And what the code calls out is that the accessory use to your house, the, the primary use of a single family home is a single family home, right? It needs to operate as a single family home. And then anything else that you do needs to be customary, incidental, appropriate, and subordinate to. 
So if you have a, a wedding for your cousin in July, that doesn't require a CUP. If you enter into it as a business endeavor, it does. So that, that is a distinction. So perhaps the Everett's did have events that, they, that now they were told that they couldn't, but there's also room to have events in Koenigstein Roan. You obviously can have your friends up for a barbecue and things like that. So there is a distinction in the code, and I just wanted to put that on the record. Dan? Well, uh, perhaps uh, Masood should go first. Um, I want to hear what you have to say, and then I don't want to be repetitive. So, Okay. Name uh, for the... Yes, problem. Masood Aragi, uh, Fire Marshal, Fire Protection District. A okay. uh, couple of things I want to mention here. Uh, first of all, I met Mr. Everett uh, in 2011, and I can tell you, he's one of the nicest person I've ever met in my life. And the issue wasn't about him. It was about the safety of the people. Uh, thinking about 150 people at essentially dead-end road was a concern to us, was a concern to the fire district as general. We really never went back and say, move the target in a sense. Yes, we have looked at the conditions, and we didn't look at it that closely to see how, much, how effective it is, how it's going to affect your project. But we looked at it a little more closely later on and looked at it and say, you know, 150 people at a dead-end road is a concern, and we have to do something about it. Now, we knew the secondary access, the road that is there, it's very, very inadequate. And if you ever get a chance to drive it, you will see what I'm talking about. It has very steep hills, very narrow. You drive that at night, it is impossible to go through. You come across multiple gates that you don't know whether it's going to be open or not. Finding a key, opening it at that time, is not a viable solution. And you also come down multiple routes. You come to Y's, multiple locations. You don't know whether you're going to go right or left. You could go right, and you end up in a dead end. So it's not a viable. So we never really looked at it from the beginning as being a viable secondary access. The only reason we entertained the idea, and we went and drove it, and we looked at it, because Mr. Everett offered that as, a, as an alternative. We wanted it to look at it and say, can we shelter the play, people in place safely? We couldn't do that either. We looked at other options. So we really, it wasn't that I was moving the target. I was trying to satisfy every possible aspect to see if we can meet the requirements. Now, there is a difference. I mean, uh, I have heard multiple people talk about they survived the fires through the years in that area. They did. There's a big difference between primary residents who live there and running a business that you're bringing 150 people who are not familiar with the area, now you're trying to evacuate. Yes, if you are living there, you're familiar with it, you go through the fire situation, you survive it, and that's fine. Once you start bringing people in at the dead end road, then we're going to have an issue. So that's why the conditions or the recommendation from the fire was to deny the CUP based on what it was proposed. And we couldn't find any other way to mitigate it. Now, the other big question is uh, whether the fire appeal boards has the jurisdiction to review and comment on it. And that's the part I cannot really answer for you. I relied on the county council telling me what the answer would be to that question when that question was proposed. Now, the fire appeals board and uh, what Mr. Freelander read in the fire code is correct, but I'd like to go a little further where he stopped uh, at, the, at the sentence. Because when you go further in the fire code, it says the Board of Appeals decision shall be final, except that in the case of appeal from the governmental agencies. So I'm not so sure how that works out. I, I don't have any degree in legal, uh, and I, do, I can't comment on that. Uh, whether they can, and, and I have heard multiple times it says the fire marshal decided that we cannot go to uh, the fire appeal board, and that is based on what I was advised by the council. Whether that's how that's going to play out, I really don't know. If they are able to go to Fire Appeals Board, come with a decision before you, I don't know how that's going to play out. But uh, the decision that was made to deny the project was solely on what was submitted and what is practically possible to do to ensure the safety of the people who are going to be on the site. If you look at the topography of the where it's sitting, sitting right on the top, and you have a steep hill on the side, that you, and fire runs uphill much faster. You saw in Arizona just recently, 19 uh, fire crew, hotshot fire crews got killed. And these are professional people. 
Fire is very dynamic. It's very unreliable. You don't know what it's going to do. You find yourself trapped. You don't know where you go. So when you have embers coming at you, you've got smoke, panic sets in, and you do things that are not rationally you're able to do. It's very easy to think about it today when you don't have a fire. You, you think about how people orderly going to evacuate. But when a fire situation comes, that is not what's going to happen. Yes, the fire crew have been on site. Yes, the fire crew used the site to fight fires, because that's what we do. But for the residents to get out in a panic situation is a very different story. So we, we have to look at it also. You could have multiple fires in the county that you've got a drawdown of resources. The fire crew may not be there. So if you have drawdown of resources, you're not going to see the same situation you have been seeing before. So that's why we dead end, essentially dead end road, running 150 people at night, drinking, or whatever situation they're in, and finding, finding themselves in a very fire situation and panic, wasn't something that I was comfortable with. And the chief wasn't comfortable either. That's why we came with that conclusion. Any questions? Any questions, chief? Yes. Just so one thing keeps on uh, repeating in the back of my head is that we're not only talking about wildfires. I mean, houses have fires just mm -hmm. every, every day. There's garage fires. That's there's true. all kinds. So um, are, is there any additional risk from having uh, this type of venue? Are there more sources of fire by having this type of venue? Uh, in other places? Anywhere. Yes, it could be. But the, uh, we always looked at it, what is the way out? How are you going to get yourself out in a safety zone? And that's what we looked at. And this particular one, I couldn't find a safety zone appropriate for that many people that they could go and be safe. And there goes my first question again, mm -hmm. then how many? Okay, thank you. Sorry, I can't. Uh, that's, that's, that's the right. part I can't answer right off the top of my head here. Got it. Sure. Blame the lawyer the next time. Under vice counsel, you can't <laughs> give the number. It's always these. Any other questions of the marshal? Thank you for your time. Appreciate Thanks. it. Michelle, did you do anything you wanted, Dan? Yes, Chair Westner, thank you. Um, I just wanted to respond to a question from Commissioner Onstott earlier on in the hearing. You asked how many properties take access from Koningstein Road. We did a quick um, review of our planning GIS database per a 2013 aerial photo. There appear to be 20 driveways that take access from Koningstein Road, including the subject property, and two of those driveways just have graded pads where houses are not built yet. And then I also wanted to make the clarification that while the county has reviewed the original project description and several subsequent revisions, the most recent revised project description that was included in your packet as Exhibit 4 has not been fully reviewed by county agencies because it was just received on July 16th. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Dan? Yeah, just to kind of augment what Ms. Brillhart and Mr. Aragi stated, um, I wanted to clarify also the requirements for when you can use a permanent structure for wedding events and what transpired back when um, there was a discussion about whether or not you could construct a shelter in place on the property that would meet the fire protection district standards and at the same time meet our requirements as interpreted o over the years and then application of the code. Um, the, if you look at the non-coastal zoning ordinance, you're going to find that there are actually very few specific regulations and standards for regulating wedding events. In fact, the only standards actually exist in the glossary definition of temporary outdoor events. And I just want to read that into the uh, record. And it's defined as outdoor recreational events such as harvest festivals, amusement rides, historic reenactments, animal events, art shows, concerts, craft fairs, weddings, and religious revival meetings. Such events shall be limited to no more than 60 days or fewer per calendar year. So you essentially have three standards. Um, you've got to meet one of the definitions of the types of uses that are allowed under this definition of temporary events. They have to be temporary. Temporary is partially defined as, you know, it must be less than 60 events per year. And temporary also relates to the other uh, criterion, which is outdoor. So you can't build a bu permanent building or structure primarily for the use of a, a wedding event. Um, we have allowed limited exceptions for accessory structures that are primarily used for another legally permissible use on the property. So if you, for example, have an accessory bathroom next to a pool, 
Um, we have allowed the bathroom to be used as a bridal changing room, but we have not allowed, and we've been consistent about this throughout all of the wedding CEPs we've evaluated, to allow you know permanent structures to house the actual events. So you can't have your weddings in a barn or something like that. So when we were, had the discussion with uh, the Everett's and the Fire Protection District, one thing we considered was, well, knowing that we'll allow certain existing structures, which are primarily permitted for a legally permissible use of your property, could we allow that to be used as a shelter in place? So what the Fire Protection District did is they went back and ran some models to determine how, ma how large the structure would have to be to accommodate how many people um, were proposed for this CUP. And what the model uh, results showed, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Aragi, was that not only do you have to engineer a structure that can withstand the fire, provide for circulation and ventilation for a sustained period of time, but it would also require vegetation removal larger than the entire project site. So when you take into consideration all of those factors, you can't build a structure which is primarily related to a legally permissible use on the property, such as a residential use or an agricultural use, which would also meet all of the requirements to qualify for a shelter in place which is large enough to accommodate the number of guests that were proposed for this. And to get to your original question, Commissioner Idukas, I hate to say it, but I think what you'd have to do is you'd have to give us a number and then they'd have to go back and run the model results to figure out how large of a shelter in place you would have to design in order to accommodate various numbers of people. You'd have to work back to figure out, you know, how large the structure would be. So... Now, with regard to private parties versus temporary events, as you can imagine, there's a very fine line there, and it becomes very challenging for us as staff to determine when something qualifies as just a private party, especially when you have fundraiser events for political events and things like that, as compared to a commercial operation or something of that nature. Um, it's kind of one of those things where we'll receive a complaint, and you kind of know it if you see it. I mean, and we look at things like how frequently are you having these events? Who are your guests? Um, we have looked at in the past, like, if, if, it, if the event is a commercial operation or not, but we don't really use that as a criterion for determining whether or not it is a type of event which qualifies as a temporary event that requires a CUP. Usually what happens is, you know, we look at how frequently these events occur and then make a determination based upon, you know, what we find out. So with that said, I think we've covered anything I be more than happy to answer whatever questions you may have. Commissioners, questions of staff. Commissioner Dukas. So the um, the barn would not be appropriate an appropriate structure, even if we reduce the number of guests down to 60 because it doesn't have uh, fire-resistant materials and ventilation. And vegetation removal, and I'll defer to Mr. Aragi to answer that question, to confirm that. Yeah, once again, Mr. Aragi, Fire Protection District. Uh, I believe... Uh, and the reason we didn't explore these other numbers was because I believe at one point I was told, and I could be wrong, that in order for the business to be, to go forward, there was a limited, there, there, was, a, there was a magic number. And I think you, uh, am I correct? I, I, that there was this magic number that they had to meet. And that was the one we evaluated. We really, beyond that, if you go lower, the business couldn't have sustained anyway. So that was, we never really looked at it beyond that. I mean, Theoretically, you could go down and say, well, what about if I have five people? Would that be an issue? No, obviously not. So uh, we really didn't explore that idea was because of that, uh, but that fact. Gotcha. Thank you. Any other questions of staff at this time? Going once, going twice. Third and final offer. Everybody's tired, I can tell. All right. What we'll do is I'll close the public hearing. And commissioners, what is your desire? Remember, we have the option of continuance. Uh, supporting the recommended actions or denying the recommended actions, but understand if we deny the recommended actions, we have no conditions of approval to approve. So it, we would have a de facto continuance anyway because we'd have to have those in front of us. So uh, what, what is the desire of the commission? I would move uh, staff's recommended actions. I have a motion. Do I hear a second? Second. I have a second. Discussion on the motion. Um, the the magic number makes uh, makes it all make sense now because it does have to be economically viable for you to have this business at your home. Um, I appreciate uh, both sides coming out and giving their testimony and all of the letters that we that we received. 
uh, there's there's things that are you know speak favorably of the project but ultimately I think it's ill-advised uh, uh, because it's just you know uh, too there needs to be too many people in order to make it work in an area where it is uh, a danger and uh, it's not just from wildfires uh, uh, there's all kinds of reasons uh, why you wouldn't want um, half of the people being uh, stranded, uh, you know, at the mile and a half from the main road. There's a lot of uh, a lot of other things that we didn't explore with regard to conditioning it. But I think ultimately that uh, that it's just uh, uh, the wrong project for the wrong place. Well. <coughs> Well, first of all, for the folks out there that came here for or against, thank you for your input. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, 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 I mean, our staff report wasn't complete because of the fire issue, our fire access road issue. Uh, and, and that's where it all lies. And I suspect that the uh, uh, lawyers for the applicant are going to see if they can't go forth to the, the board and, uh, and, and appeal. Uh, I think the biggest hang up here is the fact you're at a dead end. If you were somewhere else where there's other ways to get out already, it, it might have worked out. I suppose if you spend a lot of money and, and, and on that current road that leaves out uh, to meet the standards, well, you know, you might have some, but that seems cost prohibitive to me. So uh, I think that's where we sit. Commissioner Onsot? Well, yeah. I'm concerned that we have two parallel tracks, one for the appeal and one here. And if we get a different result as a result of the appeal, what impact that would have procedurally and substantively on us? You, staff made their position based on the fire department's recommendation. If that, if that position was overturned, what happens then? Are they fast-tracked back in front of us? How do we do that? I would say that if we had a, a favorable resolution, right, and it, from the from the fire department appeals board, if that became the case, then we would look at the project in front of us and evaluate the project in front of us, and come back in front of your commission. Okay. Thank you, Rick. I ha I have uh, as I as I heard the heard the testimony um, I you know I appreciate the the passion and, and the the concern that everyone has on both sides of the issue I I'm uh, I compliment the applicant uh, for going through the process they're trying to go through um, and you're hopping through a variety of hoops you had to hop through and and I'm not completely clear on, on what the original process was that got you in the process, got you here, but obviously it was, it was activities uh, that were outside the, the um, allowances for single family residents when he started commercializing a few events that apparently grew. Um, um, we, haven't, we haven't really had the opportunity to deal with the project description and those particular requirements. Uh, or the request that you're asking for had the pro if the project was going to be approved you know I for one have some problems with with uh, uh, the actual sound issues uh, and shutting amplification down at 1030 is just one example I have uh, I appreciate the applicants uh, uh, presentation on how these various issues would be addressed uh, uh, as relates to traffic and as relates to vehicle access to the site and the shuttling and et cetera, and the fact that there's there would be t two staff people on prem that would basically uh, oversee the the events on behalf of um, the property owner slash uh, leaseholder for the for the activity at that particular time but and I'm from my I come from a background a public safety background and I've dealt with events like this uh, and they can be very very difficult to control um, re in spite of the best intentions and I, I'm trying to visualize somebody somewhere down the road counting cars and saying oops you know we've got we've hit the limit everybody's got to turn around and go back 
um, and the, re reality, the realistic process there. Um, I just don't see how, how that, com that comes about. Uh, certainly the drinking is an issue and it will always be an issue on any event regardless of what the terrain is. But it's magnified a little bit more here, obviously. Uh, fire aside, just leaving the premises. Um, um, it's just, it's not that t the road that's, that lends itself well to that. Um, uh, I'm inclined to follow a recommended staff action. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Everts for their patience and ability. Um, sometimes you probably felt like you should have stayed in Texas, huh, Denny? <laughs> uh, they do things a little different down there. Um, I lived in Kingsville for a while, so. Uh, the, the main issues in front of me is what your, your attorney raised. Um, you were led that you could not appeal, but now there's an opportunity for an appeal. The findings for the recommended action are based on what we've been told by the fire which, does, if you've been around me long enough, I rely on the expertise of staff, particularly the police and fire, uh, because the one thing this it has an ultimate responsibility is the safety of the people in the, this county and anybody who visits. Um, and it only takes one situation. So again, um, I'm going to rely on the, the fire marshal representations. However, I do know that you can appeal. I don't think we've uh, closed that off or bridged that in any sense because we have no authority over the appeals board. Uh, you've heard staff, which is my position, if the appeals board reverses the marshal, then we can't have the findings that we have in front of us so that we'd be back into the process. Uh, so I agree with uh, my fellow commissioner here. We're kind of in the catch-22 a little bit, but this is where we're at right now. Um, again, everything I've heard, the evidence, outstanding people, the cooperation, everybody, it's just the particular situation in this situation is public safety. So. With that, um, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor of supporting the recommended actions, click your button. There you go. You don't get to vote twice. It's not Chicago. Where's the button? Uh, on the floor. It's blue. Oh, you can't oh. vote for it. Well, there's nothing here. Oh, he's got nothing on his screen. We don't have it. Yeah, he does. Nor, nor made the motion. And yeah. Paul seconded. Yeah. You're not coming through. It's in. No. It's, in. Oh, it's, in. it's in. It's in. Okay. Okay. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you've been denied. Um, you obviously have whatever process council that you need to go through. Uh, all the presentations were excellent. We read everything. Thank you very much for your time. And members of the public, we we appreciate your testimony. Uh, all right, we'll move on to item number seven, discussion. Madam Director. Thank you, Chair Westner and members of the commission. I just wanted to briefly take a moment to go over your upcoming uh, calendar, just to make sure that we are all in agreement here. So on August the 15th, that was the hearing that's continued from August the 1st. That's the Colton Lee project. That's going to be in the lower plaza assembly room. Yeah. And then moving forward to your hearing on the 19th, we have a continuation permit for Thomas Aquinas College on that day, as well as the density bonus ordinance for the county. That's September 19th. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have some quiet, please? We're trying to conduct business. Thank Sep you. September the 19th. Not okay. Mm -hmm. And then on October the 24th, we have an appeal of the planning director's equivalency determination and an appeal of a notice of violation for Mr. Hagel of Hagel Lumber Company. So that is what we have right now on the agenda. It's, it's quite full. And then we have had discussions before about going to the first and the third Thursday. So we are going to, um, you know, we're trying to adhere to that schedule as we go through the rest of the year. but. You know you're available uh, at any time, and then are on any on any given Thursday at least, and then we will uh, come back for the at the first meeting and set that new agenda. So that's all I have. If you any have anything items? for me, Commissioner Rodriguez. No, we we had or I had in my notes a tentative tentative right. meeting date of September 12th. Obviously, that's off the calendar. Right. 
Okay, thank you. Now, for some reason, I had penciled in for the 22nd, but I, I didn't see it on the website or anything like that. Okay. Good. Then I won't be yeah. screaming to the airport from here, moving everybody along. All right, anything else from the commissioners for? Well, just for clarification, I wasn't sure. originally available for the 19th, but I am now. Okay, so do we have all five commissioners for the 19th? Very good, that's good. All right, anything else for the good of the order? This meeting stands adjourned. <laughs>